Howdy, folks. Welcome back to the Yet to Be Entitled podcast podcast. Uh, I am joined today by a 76ers fan, uh, a slop extraordinaire, a ball knower on the You Know Ball podcast, uh, Trill. Uh, how you doing today, man? Doing well. Uh, we are both sitting here a few weeks after our teams have been eliminated and i gotta say i am i'm personally enjoying uh this we're used to being eliminated in the second round Mm -hmm. so having a few weeks just to really dive into the slop and also to enjoy basketball as a neutral fan has been a a lot of fun this year so playoff playoffs been more fun than i expected uh even with the sixers out yeah it's Weird, because I enjoyed the second round every other series, but the Nuggets series was hell on earth for me because it went from two games, oh, it's so over, two games, oh, we're so back, game five, oh, we're winning this series, game six, what the fuck happened? Game seven, oh, we're up 20 points, I, I might as well start pouring the champagne. Wait, we, huh? Wait, we what? And then... You know, we've seen two uh, poten- a sweep in the Eastern Conference Finals and potentially the closest sweep of all time, second to the Lakers and Nuggets from last season in, in Dallas and in, in, uh, Minnesota. So two very different series, both fun in their own ways, kind of. The basketball's good. It's just yeah. It's just the end of games. It's obvious which teams are better at <laughs> executing and better in general. Yeah, like – the Celtics and Pacers is, is fun for the first three and a half quarters. Mm-hmm. And then Jalen Brown becomes good. And yeah. then TJ McConnell uh, led offense doesn't become as good. And four out. Whereas Minnesota, I could see Minnesota still stealing a couple games. Maybe no, uh, Derek lively. That's big. He's been amazing. That is big. He has been like absolutely killing it for a rookie. Their tanking last year worked. Yeah, um, I've always all, I've always supported that. So, and trust the process. Uh, <laughs> Unironically, <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's it's a weird thing watching b- basketball as a neutral again because I forgot what it was kind of like because I didn't care about the playoffs when Jamal Murray and Michael Porter were hurt because sure. what are you gonna? It's you're lo- missing your two of your four best players, uh, and then last season I wasn't concerned. At all during the entire thing, I was like, "We have Bruce Brown. It's good." And uh, now I'm like, "Oh, right. I forgot this feeling." Yeah, you have the best player in the world, Bruce Brown. Yeah, yeah, you know <laughs> the one that matters. Felt comfortable. Felt comfortable when when you had Bruce, and then you know you lose him, and you know anything can happen. It's similar to when Kawhi left the Raptors or Katie <laughs> left the Warriors. Ironically, Bruce a Raptor. Uh, there you go. Soon to be a nugget again. Once Michael Porter Jr. is the second Porter brother for the Raptors. Yeah, we're uh, deporting him. Yeah, Bruce Brown, Kelly Olynyk. You are Denver Nuggets. There you go. Well, you get a Canadian in exchange for an American going to Canada. I think that's yeah. a good tra- trade off. Yeah, uh, you know, just uh, exchange programs. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's let's start with uh, how how do you feel about this season as just kind of blanket statement. How do you feel about this season in its entirety? As a Sixers fan? Yeah. I felt really good about this team in a way that I didn't expect to because this season kind of started similarly to the way that the Sixers 21-22 season started with yeah. a player demanding out, Daryl Morey saying, no, I'm not doing that, and uh, it leading into training camp. And I kind of... In my head, I had chalked it up to a punt year where I was like, all right, look, if you're not going to make a trade with James Harden, then we might as well just kind of focus on on next year. And hopefully this year we have little wins, but you can't have a max player sit out and not, you know, and compete for a championship like that's just never happened before in the history of the NBA. So in my mind, I kind of had chalked it up to like this is going to be a bit of a a gap year, a disaster year, whatever you want to call it. And then they end up caving and they trade Harden and they go on a run in the middle of this season before Joel Embiid gets hurt. Mm -hmm. And Tyrese Maxey takes his step into all-stardom. The role players kind of fit very well around the duo that they were building with Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey. I thought it was the best season of Joel Embiid's 
career before he got hurt. Absolutely. And I felt like they had just as good of winning a championship as anyone else. And then, of course... (laughs) (laughs) As is tradition. Sixers fandom happens. Which yep. is, uh, you know, Joel, a lot of people think Joel's injury prone, which I think it's obviously the case. Yeah. But I think that it's, I don't think people realize that this was the first time that he had missed more than two weeks since his rookie year. Really? He has never had an injury where he's missed longer than two weeks. Now, huh. sometimes you have the all-star game in yeah. you know, around an injury or you have the playoffs or whatever. But if you factor in the amount of games that he actually missed, he had not missed more than two weeks worth of games consecutively uh, since he was a rookie. So huh. I actually think his injury stuff is more pronounced because of the playoffs. Yeah. And when he ramps up the playoff intensity, he tends to get injured and, and has kind of sometimes freak accidents, but sometimes like injuries that are yeah. you could see coming from a mile away because of the his play style. And... This year was the first time where he he missed. I mean, he missed half the season. And once he was out, I kind of once again chalked it up to, well, what can you do? Your best yeah. player's out. Um, the team is falling down the sandings. Um, I expect them to make moves at the deadline, but I don't really know if there's anything that you can do to salvage this season. And they hang tough. You know, they, they, mm-hmm. they have... They, they get into the play and they win the play and they have a puncher's chance. But ultimately, I always kind of felt like there was like this cloud over this season. Yeah. Where even with all of the positives with Kelly Oubre overperforming on his veterans minimum, Nick Nurse having a pretty good year when the team was all healthy as his first year as head coach, Maxi becoming an all-star, and Joel having his best season between the Harden stuff and the Joel injury. I just thought it was way too much to overcome for this team. Yeah. And then by the time the playoffs came around, it was just obvious that Joel was – was not going to be healthy enough, and honestly, I thought he played his best offensive series uh, so far in the playoffs, and it just didn't really matter because uh, the Knicks were better and deeper, and yeah. um, that ended up being kind of the nail in the coffin for this team was their lack of depth and versatility, and overall, I feel fine about the season just because, I, like I said, from the jump, I didn't really have high expectations, but yeah. what you described of that series being it's over, we're back... That was mm-hmm. this whole season. Oh, back and yeah. Forth, back and yeah. forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it was a very much a it's over, we're back season. And now uh, hopefully they can kind of course correct here this off season. Yeah, because you guys set yourselves up uh, for the potential to have a very good off season. Uh, this has been Maury's plan from my understanding for like a couple of seasons now. He's like, we're going to get two max slots or a max slot. I don't, I think a max slot because. Yeah salaries have changed because all and also because all of the players that they're chasing are like 10 years plus basically yeah. so, so like, like Jimmy million. Butler, lebron james paul yeah. george they're all gonna make a third of the cap basically yeah uh, what do you mean lebron's gonna make a minimum on the suns oh right i forgot about yeah that part. yeah, yeah. But Dude. we have no shot because he wants yeah. to go play with Bronny in the desert so bro that quick sidebar that is an insane thing that he is denying workouts with all but two teams the suns and the lakers that is ridiculous to me <laughs> i have a, i have a buddy whose theory is like well two two things one mm-hmm. obviously he's going to work out for the lakers because obviously is the lakers yeah and two the gm of the suns is lebron's friend james jones yeah so if, if things haven't been going great in these combine workouts and workouts in general for Bronny, to yeah. not have it get out to the other teams is probably beneficial to LeBron, uh, Bronny, all of them, and in, in in his chances to get drafted. Because I, I'm be honest, I don't think he's an NBA player now. Like I, I hmm. maybe if he, if I thought if he went back to school, he had a year where he could prove that he was, you know, more of what we thought he was. And obviously, he had some health issues and and yeah. some serious stuff that happened. So you want to give a little bit of a grace period for that. But just on its face. If he weren't LeBron James, he would not get drafted. And I do think that coming into uh, the situation that he's coming into in the NBA, it might be a little bit better to maybe have a little... I don't know if he's turning down the Chicago Bulls because, or the Denver Nuggets or whoever, the Dallas Mavericks, and workouts because uh, he doesn't want to go there. But it might be more about the fact that, like... He's probably just not ready, and yeah. they don't they don't want the word to get out on that. <laughs> that's that's fair. 
I I will say I'm kind of higher on Bronny than a lot of people because I think he can still be an NBA player. This is largely influenced by me seeing uh, his high school tape, and that'd be good. And also Peyton Watson, uh, because Peyton Watson averaged 3.3 points a game in college on like 30-something percent from the field. And he has been good, very good uh, relative to expectation uh, in his second season. No, I would Um, say to go from not being in a college rotation two years ago. Yeah to being a legit NBA rotation player by 21 years old is like an incredible leap. Yeah. And his dude, his defense is also so fucking fun. But like, I, I think I could see a, a path for Bronny where he kind of becomes Io Desunmu, you know, something like that. Like Io Desunmu is Drew Holiday light to me and he could become like Drew Holiday light, light, light. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Light squared. Um, but you know, I, I, I'm, I think he could become an NBA player. I do think that it is an outlier if he does, but. Well, that, that's the thing is that most of the guys that underperform in college mm-hmm. are outliers in themselves. And I kind yeah. of already thought that Bro- just based on his size and his tools and his game in general, there's not a ton of off ball three and D guards left in general. There's like a handful. Yeah. Really, it's like yeah. Anthony Melton was a guy that I thought could be similar to him. Davion um, Mitchell, kinda. Kinda, but not really. Like and yeah. Davion's like a fringe rotation guy, I think. Yeah. And like it, I guess like the peak of it would probably be like Derek White. Um yeah. but all of those guys are kind of exceptions to rules. And then you have the went to college and underperformed exception to rules. So you have multiple exceptions to rules on top of each other. And like yeah. all the guys who have underperformed the three main guys that I always think of in terms of underperforming in college and then going to the NBA and being successful are who you just said. Peyton Watson was mm-hmm. one of them. Yeah. Zach Levine was another one that was not very funny. Also went to UCLA. Yeah. Um, and then the third one is, is Jaden McDaniels. And the difference between Bronny and those guys is that those guys are six, Big. seven. Yeah. Like, I mean, like yeah. uh, uh, six, 10 in, in McDaniels case, yeah. six, five in Levine's case in uh, Bronny's a very good athlete. Those guys yeah. are incredible athletes, athletic freaks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like, th- there has to be some sort of way where you can get Bronny into assist, uh, like, he doesn't want to take a two way, but he'll probably yeah. have to play in the G League a lot and work out the kinks in his game to yeah. hopefully get to the point where he can be that rotation level guy in the NBA. And it's not impossible. I mean, his dad's LeBron James, and he was very good in high school, and then had yeah. a setback with the health stuff. So it's it's definitely possible. It's just like first round pick. That's a bit much for me. Yeah. Right? Like if you took him in the second, sure. Uh, most second yeah. round picks aren't NBA players anyway, so I don't yeah. really care about that. Yeah. To me, second round pick in this in this draft specifically is like, yeah, no, just just take whoever you want. Like, take yeah. Patrick Mahomes if you want. I don't. Yeah. Fuck like, <laughs> yeah, take take anyone. I don't care because like this draft, it, it's probably going to end up being better than people are saying just because like typically speaking, unless it's like the 2000 draft, every draft produces at least around three all stars, give yeah. or take. And I I don't see all-star paths for basically anyone in this draft class from what I've seen, which is not as much as I typically do draft stuff, but like besides Saar and Ron Holland, but like maybe Zachary Risa is actually good except like, and I'm not seeing it in despite watching like 10 different games and being like, I don't, I don't see it here. Well, my buddy Chuck, who is like very into draft stuff, yeah, we talked about 2013, 2015 as kind of the analog for this. Those were the last drafts where the difference in 15 is that Carl Anthony Towns was the clear number one guy. Um, mm-hmm. And 2013, we didn't have anyone that was that consensus number one. You know, in retrospect, it very obviously should have been Victor Oladipo yeah. with the first pick, um, even though he didn't end up having the best NBA career like Giannis and Gobert and all yeah. those guys. But they were never going to be drafted at the top of the draft right so the thing is is that i do think that you can find value in a draft like this because of the lack of consensus and chuck and me have talked about this a lot where it's like this is the kind of draft where you want to take a swing because if you look historically at the bad drafts the guys the 2013 draft is always my favorite example of this is that the two guys that really panned out from that draft 
were athletic freaks who had yep. incredible dimensions and uh you know were were very young and raw when they were drafted yeah. and then they ended up becoming hall of fame players Rudy Gobert and Giannis so I do think that there is a case to be made that the lack of consensus is good for the teams that draft end of lottery to end of first round. And yeah. this is really where you want to take risks on guys that in a normal year you might take a safer pick. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, look, Tristan De Silva is a guy that I think is going to be have a five to ten year NBA career, be a surefire thing. If I had the 16th pick in the draft and I'm the Sixers, mm -hmm. I'm probably swinging higher because I think that yeah. if you hit on that guy – that can change your fortune, not just now, but for the next, you know, five to ten years, even post Joel and Bead Prime. Yeah. Um, and, and you got to look at you got to look at the upside in some more of these pr prospects. That even if you miss on them, it would be it would be ideal to have a uh, it would be ideal to have a guy that you can add to your core that is uh, like a game changer. Deron Holmes, you are the third prospect in this draft. That's right. I think I have him eight or nine right now, but like, I have him top ten. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's the kind of guy that, like, might be he, – he might be the kind of – him and him and a few – there are a few guys in this draft yeah. where it's, like, the perfect middle ground of safe and potentially underrated yeah. ceiling. And I think that Deron Holmes is one of them. I think Devin Carter has a shot to be that. I can and see I, that. I, 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 I'm a little bit lower on his, his like, star upside potential yeah. in a way that, like, if everything falls into place for Deron Holmes – then maybe you're looking at a not quite as good version of like Pascal Siakam or something yeah. like that. I don't think he has the handle of, of Siakam, but kind of in a similar mold of player. Yeah. And then uh, who else was my, who is my, honestly, I do think that Cody Williams might be being a little bit undersold in that department as well. Yeah. I, I think it's just, it's so rare that you get a freshman wing who's, who, who is so incredibly efficient. Yeah and is a solid two-way player and is still 19 years old with better tools and production than his brother had at his age. Yeah. And his brother became, is going to very obviously be an all-star. So Yeah, like he, uh, Jackson Frank's a top 20 player. And listen, I don't I don't quite agree with top 20, but like he's going to get there probably. Right yeah, he, yeah. I mean, and yeah. he's 23, so. Yeah, so yeah. like I have no reservations about J-Dub in the future. I He can be... A lot of things. Um, but I think Jared McCain is another one of my guys in this draft. One, because he's a he's a good NBA player. And two, because I need homophobia to go away. And if a dude with pain and nails <laughs> hits, hits a game seven uh, buzzer beater, then maybe, just maybe. Yeah, yeah the uh, rumors will be furious. It would be great. <laughs> Him and Caleb Williams, they need to carry the torch. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, like, Jared McCain, I think... I think he's going to be like Seth Curry, but like, sure. I think that he has some like tool. Like I, I haven't watched a ton of draft stuff, but of the stuff I've watched, he's pops out to me as the best like Duke prospect in this draft. Uh, Filipowski sucks. I don't want anything to do with Filipowski. If I'm any team really, uh, unless you got a really good like context for him, I don't really see yeah. a way that you can take a gamble on a guy like that. Unless you're either patient or you have, like, a great shooting coach who's going to yeah. turn him into, like, a knockdown stretch five guy. Yeah, like, I saw Filipowski mocked to the Nuggets, and I damn near threw my computer. Because <laughs> uh, if they Ron Holmes will be perfect for you guys. Oh, yeah, no. You need. Yeah. yeah, no, that's who I, I'm like, we need to get Dayron. We need to get Dayron. Please, please. <laughs> you guys are, what, 26 uh, right now is your pick? 28, I believe. 28, okay. And like, there's a there's an outside shot he falls. Um, Honestly, the, the 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 guys that I think could be in that range that would be nice for you guys are literally the three guys that are right in that range right now on yeah. Tankathon, which I that will change. These guys, some of these guys will rise. Yeah. But Daron Holmes, Jalen Tyson, and and Bob Carrington are the three yeah. guys that I think would be because you guys you guys kind of low key need more ball handling. I don't think not low key, is, not low key. We but, need more ball. Handling. But the thing is, is that most people just think what the front office's strategy has yeah. been and what most people on the outside think is just give Jokic athletic wings and it doesn't matter. Yeah. At a certain point, there's going to be a ceiling to that, as we've seen. Yeah. Like, even like if the wings play poorly, like Michael Porter Jr. did, if Jamal <laughs> Murray has an off series like he did, uh, that you're going to yeah. need to have a release valve guy. And I, yeah. I mean, to me personally, if I'm looking for a release valve guy with potentially more upside, 
If you can get Bob Carrington at 28, that's like that's a home run. Yeah, I mean he a grand he has, salami. To me, he has a really wide range of outcomes as a prospect. Yeah, where like I could see him becoming like a high, his tools are good enough that I could see him becoming like a high level ball handler, maybe like a maybe like a better version of what Spencer Dinwiddie was for the Mavericks a few years ago. Yeah, and then I could also see him becoming like a legit like fringe All Star guy. Yeah, if he and especially if he goes to his like. I mean, playing playing off Jokic is like the easiest thing for a prospect. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing Peyton Watson go from not being able to play in college to being a rotation player in yeah. under three years, which does not happen. But that's what I'm talking about, like yeah. developmental con. Honestly, like I don't I don't like Filipowski, but if Filipowski mm-hmm. went to the Nuggets, I'd probably feel better about him. Because I mean, if yeah, could play him with Jokic and have him be Jokic's backup, and he can ease into that. I would totally understand like the the developmental context of that. Yeah, I think the Nuggets do have a good development staff. But I think a lot of the reason they have good development is because Jokic is just the easiest player in the league to play off of. Yeah, Yeah, like, oh, I just have to backdoor cut. Oh, I just have to DHO. Okay. Like... It's like why Afonso McKinney and and, uh, Jordan Bell were able to play for the Warriors during the KD Steph years. Like, yeah, it's easy if you're if you have two of the five best players in the NBA or a superstar (laughs) like Steph or Jokic. Like, it's just it's it's offense on easy mode for for you. Cut, shoot, pass. Like, that's literally your job. Look, the all time great offensive players, LeBron, Jokic, Steph, they all make it the game much easier for everyone who plays around them. And it's, it's easier to find those guys on the fringes. Yeah. And like, I, speaking of the lack of ball handling, that was the biggest like thing going into the season. I was like, our, our second best ball handlers, Reggie Jackson. <laughs> are, are we sure about this? And he came out, it, Calvin Booth came out with that wild KOC article yeah. where he was like, Peyton Watson is just better than Bruce Brown. And I'm like, he's what? Like listen, Bruce listen I, 27. Like, yeah. Like, 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 yeah, maybe in five years he'll be better yeah. than that. But right now, I don't think so. Yeah, it's like Bruce Brown was averaged like 16 points during the Lakers series and was very clearly like the third most impactful player on some nights. Not o- overall on the run. I would probably give that to Aaron Gordon. But like there were nights where he was like the second or third best nugget. And he was closing games. And I was like, Going into the season, he was like, you know, Peyton Watson is just, he's better passer. He's a better, and I'm like, okay, let's pump the brakes. Cause like I've, I've talked to Peyton Watson. I've interviewed him. Great guy. Love, love the player. He's not better than Bruce. Brown. <laughs> yeah. That's an absurd expectation to put on someone who played 10 games in their rookie season going into their second season. Uh, and Christian Brown has never showed ball handling. Like that's yeah. just not something he flashed at Kansas during any of his years during the championship run like he's good at attacking off closeouts but that's not ball handling to me no. uh, so it's like who's our ball handler look like look at the transaction log reggie jackson on the taxpayer mid-level exception yeah who else was bidding for reggie jackson yeah it doesn't really make it and it, that move never really made any sense to me it, <laughs> yeah I, I, i'll be honest like i, I the, the 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 i think that bruce brown Josh Hart's probably going to be the new guy that gets compared to, yeah. like, in the draft. Like, oh, he could be the next Josh Hart. Bruce yeah. Brown was that guy for a little bit where it was like, oh, he could be the next Bruce Brown. But I do think that those players are such unique players in that, like, there's really no one with Bruce Brown's skill set that is currently on a – like, I honestly think probably one of the closer players – and I've always said DeAnthony Melton's kind of like an inverse Bruce Brown when he's yeah. healthy, where like I- instead of being like a slasher ball handler, short roll creator, if you were more of a three, uh, you know, a guy who who was uh, just catch and shoot, attack closeouts, move the ball kind of guy, that Melton fits into that. He could do a little bit of short roll playmaking, mm-hmm. but in general, and like instead of being like a dog on the ball like Bruce is, he's more off the ball. But like yeah. in general, that archetype of like. 6-4 guy who's built like a truck that can yeah. that can that can handle that can run some offense but also has become like an improved spot up shooter can do all of the little things that you want on both ends of the court from a role player he's basically the rare swiss army knife guy that works out in the nba that's just doesn't necessarily have an elite skill but is like good at everything yeah and on a team like the nuggets that was just like completely invaluable to what yeah. they wanted to do so i do think that uh he and and you're gonna see a lot in this draft oh this guy could be 
he could be the Bruce. There are there's only one Bruce Brown, and like yeah. I know he's a role player, so it seems insane to say that, but like he has such a rare skill set of like blend of athleticism, yeah. ball handling, shooting, all that stuff. It's just it's hard to come by. Yeah. That being said, Bruce Brown, you are a Denver Nugget. Michael Porter Jr., get ready to learn Canada, buddy. Could be a Philadelphia 76er. I'm just saying. Uh, back off. Back off. <laughs> no. Um, saying, if, if, he, yeah, if, if the Raptors he can't find a trade for him, no one wants to take on that contract. Yeah. And he opts out of his deal. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that what happened with him last year kind of set this new model for, and especially seeing the Pacers in the ECF yeah. being like, okay. If there aren't options out there that you really like, overpay Sign. a guy who you think is good. Yeah. And see if they fit. And if they don't fit, then flip. Like, I think that KCP could be an option for that. I think Clay could mm -hmm. be an option for that. I think Bruce Brown could be an option for that. I think there are guys that if, uh, you know, it doesn't work out with whatever current team that they're on, that mm -hmm. the balloon payment thing is a nice way to kind of keep your, your options open while also being competitive and good with that player. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And also, I think, like, I wouldn't be shocked if the Sixers just trade for Bruce Brown outright. Because, like, Embiid has started doing some of the elbow playmaking stuff. Obviously not to the level of Jokic, but, like, he's an improved playmaker. Yeah. Um, and, like, he could run – Bruce Brown would fit great next to Tyrese and, yeah. and Embiid. Like, genuinely speaking, that would be a fantastic addition for you guys. And it would it would absolutely break my heart if you guys got Bruce Brown and KCP. I would, like – you would not see me on the internet again. Uh. I was going to say, I think that if they are to get, uh, I think that if they are to get, um, uh, all right, sorry. Um, <laughs> it, it, I think if they are to get um, Bruce Brown, yeah, it would probably be in a scenario where the Raptors decline the team option. Probably. And then they, they do the balloon payment thing again, but it's like, mm -hmm. The first year's like eighteen million, and yeah. then the second year's like twenty million or whatever. Yeah. Because I think that they're gonna the, the one of the reasons why they didn't chase him at the deadline was because they like him, but it's just that takes up like almost half your cap space. For yeah. A guy who's really good, but at the end of the day, what is he gonna be on the Sixers? Like, is he gonna be a fist starter? Okay, can yeah. you pay a fist starter twenty six million dollars a year? Like yeah. But yeah, well I'd be interested to see what happens with him because I think he yeah. can help a lot of teams. I do too. And that's Speaking of the fifth star thing, uh, KCP, that's what I've been trying to, to figure out because he is the fifth star for the Nuggets. Uh, will they pay him what other teams could pay him is the question uh, because that will get them to the second apron in all likelihood yeah. because the, star, the, the price tag for a starter nowadays is like 20, 25 mil, somewhere in that zone. And uh, it's... He, he could help a lot of teams like the Magic, the Sixers, the Spurs. I expect that basically every single team with cap space to be interested in KCP because yes. he is basically the perfect role player to add if you're a contender. And he's a great veteran leader if uh, and can provide shooting if you're like the Magic or the Spurs. And the Nuggets, uh, with the way that Calvin Booth has been talking, I am a little uh, scared that they're not going to resign KCP. And I, I still expect them to, but I'm less sure of that than I was like three weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, especially considering like he didn't have a good playoff run. Uh, I he wonder injured, if that, but yeah, yeah, he was, but like also he just wasn't shooting as well as he normally yeah. does. And like, you know, I, I don't blame him, but also everyone's kind of hurt in the playoffs. So yeah. he's also getting up there in age a little bit. He's like 30, 31. Yeah, sneaky 31 because he's a guy that didn't really pop as a role player until like six or seven years into his yeah. career. But he was the 2013 draft. Yeah. yeah one of like uh, the five, probably the fifth best player from that draft. Yeah. And like he's probably going to get like 375, if I had to guess, from some team. I, I yeah. hope it's the Nuggets because if – if the Nuggets can't re-sign KCP, they are kind of screwed. Yeah. Because, like, you don't have another avenue to add a shooter of that caliber or a defender of that caliber, uh, let alone a player that is, is both of those things. Uh, because Christian Brown can kind of do the defense thing, but he's not nearly the shooter that KCP is. He shot, like, 37% on low volume, but also that's the most Mickey Mouse 37% I've, I've ever seen in a player. He made, like, two threes of the entire playoff run. Yeah. That, like, that's just not... I think Aaron Gordon made more threes in like two games than he did in the entire. Christian Brown is is kind of the other end of the Swiss Army knife guy, <laughs> where like he's pretty good at everything but not great at anything. Yeah, and that makes you a nice bench player, but 
in order to be like a high impact role player, it's it's a really hard archetype to nail. Yeah. And he's 24 already, I think. 23, 23 24, something, okay, 23, something like that. I, I don't okay. know off the top of my head. Yeah. But yeah, he's got, he, he's got some room to grow, I would say, but not, you're definitely not feeling great if he's starting for you next year. Yeah. And also, even if he has room to grow, I don't think he grows into like a star caliber player. No, really. I, I, I just meant like a Bruce Brown like yeah, level yeah. role player type. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I, I'd be, I love him as a rotation piece, but if he's starting, I'm going to be like, uh, huh? What, yeah. what now? Um, but yeah, that it's a interesting conundrum because I feel like they'll pony up because uh, like Cronkies have never had issues paying player salaries. It's it's the other stuff unless unless it's Rocky. Uh, for some reason, Rocky is the highest paid mascot of the NBA. Let's go. Uh, but <laughs> Rocky take it up, <gasps> take it up it's a good twenty percent of the cap. Rocky. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was gonna say. I was going to say, it's interesting to me that you say that because, like, my thought on the, the KCP thing is, mm-hmm. like, you're sacrificing a little bit of youth with Michael Porter Jr. Because Michael Porter Jr. is still, like, 25, 26. Yeah. But also, Michael Porter Jr. has the back of, like, a 40-year-old, potentially. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, also, on top of that, it's not like he's going to grow much more. He kind of is mm-hmm. who he is now. Yeah. And... The thing with KCP is, like, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get one of the best point-of-attack defenders in the NBA. You're going to get a guy who works really well with that two-man game with Jokic. Yep. And the Porter Jr. thing is interesting to me because, like, if you told me that the Nets blew it up yeah, and somehow the Nuggets were able to acquire Cam Johnson, Mm -hmm. then you could just – and a team was higher on Michael Porter Jr., you could basically get Michael Porter Jr. for almost half the cost and then save enough money to get KCP – back yeah. on a reasonable deal too so like you take all the money that you're paying towards those two right now and mpj and kcp with mm-hmm. kcp's like 13 14 million a year and then the 30 whatever and just turn that into like two twenty two million dollar deals yeah that seems like a reasonable kind of like the the hard part is like actually having enough to acquire cam johnson because yeah. i think he could get a, a a decent amount on the open market but yeah. like even if you wanted to go lower like would dorian finney smith be that much different than michael porter jr in in his role on the nuggets like yes I, like that's the thing is like i don't know how much different it would be in terms of <laughs> those two like in mm-hmm. in a vacuum michael porter jr is just a better player than yeah dorian finney smith. but if if you are the fifth starter on the team that is a lower yeah. usage player that you're going to basically park in the corner off Jokic, have him do cuts, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe the skill set is a, a bit redundant because he's just kind of mm-hmm. like a worse, different version of Aaron Gordon. But it's yeah. just a thought of like a player who's cheaper that's going to put up a ton of threes on volume yeah. that is going to be able to, you know, finish inside the arc and defend his ass off. Like, I don't really think that there's that much of a difference if you were to acquire him in, in his in, in that role. Yeah, I can see that, like, train of logic. I agree with, like, the Cam Johnson thing. Dorian yeah. Finney-Smith, There to me, there's a big drop-off as a shooter, which hurts. Sure. Um, and the versatility but, of his shooting, too, because, like, yeah. MPJ can come off screens and shoot. Like, like he is – he's been, <laughs> Dorian Finney-Smith is basically just super PJ Tucker. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, there was – I know he didn't have a good Timberwolves series, but, man, that Lakers series. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, there was the one where – the one three he hit where Aaron Gordon, like, saved the ball and, like, chucked it uh, behind his head and yeah. MPJ just caught it and shot it. There was one uh, video of Nikias reacting to it where he was on playback and he, he goes, oh, they saved it. And then he, Michael Shusicki goes, Michael, what? And then it goes in and he just throws his headphones. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that basically sums up the Michael Porter. He's the most no-no yes player in the league. Right. Or the most yes, yes, no player in the league because he'll like dribble super a little high bit. variance. Yeah, high variance. but you kind of need those guys in the playoffs. Yeah, like we've seen that with Josh Hart. We've seen that with with the 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 Celtics right now. Derek White, like Derek yeah. White, can have a series like he did against the Heat, where he literally looks like an all star, and then he goes missing for a full series, and you're like, yeah. what happened? But you, in, in a way, you'd almost rather have that than a guy like Dorian Finney-Smith, who's like gonna get you what you want i mean tobias harris is a perfect example yeah. for the sixers before he really fell off a cliff this year it was always like if to Tob- if you need 20 points from tobias he's gonna get you 17 yeah like that's 
the thing is like you you can expect an efficient 15 or 16 yeah. from Tobias but don't expect much more than that and you almost rather have the guys that can take over a playoff game with their volume yeah. shooting or with their scoring as opposed to guy and you know like the like the floor falls out with Michael Porter Jr sometimes but he also helps you destroy the Lakers in that series yeah one one player that I've kind of seen a couple of people talk about I don't think this has any legs or anything but it's a Sixers target uh Paul mm-hmm. George uh, a side and trade with him. Uh, a side and shade for Paul George for like Michael Porter and stuff. Cause Mike, uh, listen, Paul George in that MPJ role, that moves me. Yeah. I mean, that's it. <laughs> you're winning another title next year. Congratulations. Yeah. If that, happens. yeah, but Michael Porter Jr. Who can handle the ball a little bit is, yeah. <laughs> uh, and is, is better on defense when he wants to be. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like an ideal fit. Yeah. Cause so many times you see MPJ catch the ball and then you're like, He's either going up with it or he's passing it. He can't, he can't dribble. And then he does a sidestep three, and you're like, oh, ball handling creation. Yeah. And then it, it's the Michael Porter Jr. cycle of, oh, maybe he can create. No, he can't create. Oh, you know, so on and so forth. But, he's uh, really just diet clay. Like, it's, yeah, he's, like, that's who he is. And yeah. like, the difference is that clay was able to sprint off a screen, and Michael mm-hmm. Porter Jr.'s not quite sprinting off a screen. He yeah. Can, he, can, he can run off a screen. He can do it. He can run a pin down, but he, he, yeah. ain't, he ain't making it impossible to contest that shot. Yeah. Cause he has drop foot. So he has to always wear like an ankle brace or something. So right. it's, I don't know if it's physically possible for him to sprint off a screen. Sure. Um, but no, but, the, the Paul George thing, if you're the Clippers, would you rather just have him walk to like the magic of the Sixers or would you rather trade him to play with Jokic? And then you're just like, <laughs> Oh fuck! We have no chance. Like we already struggled to beat the Nuggets in yeah. general. Now they're adding Paul George, like in a role that is basically already with a worse Paul George in it. Yeah. <laughs> but but hey, you guys are getting Michael Porter Jr. and Justin Holiday. But but at the same time, it is kind of better than getting nothing because yeah, MPJ as the third or fourth option alongside Harden and Kawhi it has one the team is healthy. And that's and yeah. also like I mean like look like I've seen with. I saw I saw James Harden towards, turn George Niang into <laughs> into a rotation player in the playoffs. And if you can do that, then yeah. I think that it, uh, Michael Porter Jr. would be a really really good fit with, yeah. with him. Yeah. But uh let's let's pivot into the Sixers. Uh speaking of Paul George, what do you make of all the links to the thir- mid 30 year olds uh in in paying them 50 million a year? <laughs> Well, as a mid thirty year old that also would like to make fifty million dollars a year, <laughs> I fully support what the Sixers are doing right now. Um, no, you know what's funny is I've gone very back and forth on it, but I'm mm-hmm. kind of in the camp now of with Joel's latest knee injury. I get why they would do it because yeah, you can't really be picky when like you've struck out so many times trying to find the right match. Yeah. And now you're at a point where, like, look, they can they've restocked the cupboard a little bit with the picks. They have five first round picks to trade. Yep, a couple of high value have, ones. Yeah, the Clippers won. <laughs> as we talk yeah. about them. Uh, and we talk about the fact that they have like sixty million in space right now if they get rid of basically everyone but Maxi and Embiid, mm-hmm. uh, and unironically Ricky Council. Um, oh, Ricky's good. No, Ricky is good, and also Ricky makes one point nine million dollars a year. So, yeah, like, it, you need. We, we're seeing right now with the mm-hmm. Celtics and the and the Wolves, you need some scam contracts in order. To yeah, be, like if you're not gonna have a, like, and it's not to say that Joel isn't this guy, this one A yeah. peak superstar guy. It's to say you can't rely on him potentially for a multitude of reasons in the mm-hmm. playoffs. Whether it's injuries, whether it's conditioning, whether it's just he has a bad game, he, he has a, he's a yeah. little bit more flawed offensively than some of the more traditional one A superstars that we're used to. Mm-hmm. You can't re, you you kind of need to have a team that has a little bit more rounded out depth. And right now, what we're seeing with like Jason Tatum's another guy like this. He's always available, but he kind of you know he comes and goes. Like yeah. one game he's incredible. The next game, he's, you know, he can shift into role player mode. And if you have a team that you're trying to build to sustain for a long playoff run, and even in the regular season kind of keep you afloat, I understand the idea of going for a Jimmy Butler, Paul George, whoever, LeBron James, who could ever be available at this uh, this offseason. The difference is that if I'm in the Sixers position right now, 
I'm saying if Jimmy Butler and Paul George were both free agents, it would be yeah. an interesting conversation to me. Yeah. Paul George being a free agent and being able to be acquired for nothing yeah. is a little bit different than giving up stuff to go get Brandon Ingram or Jimmy Butler yeah. or whoever. So I do think that that is still the number one A best plan if yeah. it's even remotely realistic because of the fact that all the stuff we just talked about, he can relieve for pressure offensively off your best player. He can carry yep. a little bit along with Maxi when Joel misses time or vice versa. Joel can, can carry a little bit when, yeah. uh, when Paul George misses time in the regular season and then come playoff time. I mean, look, neither of them have great playoff reputations, <laughs> but the idea behind it is essentially if we can get this thing right with all the, all the health, the East is not good but it still has Boston and like yeah. the Sixers, if they were to go the role player way, it's hard to acquire at the same time. Like what the Celtics yeah. have done right now, it, 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 you guys were even lucky to honestly get KCP and Bruce Brown in the same off season, because yeah. it's rare that you're a ever able to get multiple good role players in one transaction cycle. You might get yeah. one in the off season and one at the trade deadline. Yeah. You might get one at the trade deadline in 2022. And then a year and a half later, get two, one who's like, a, or two or, who are basically both all-stars and drew holiday and uh, Christoph Porzingis that can slot yeah. into role player roles as well. But that team being as good as they are, like, I, mm -hmm. I don't think they're going away next year. And if you're rolling into next season with Maxi and Bead and good role players, uh, yeah. Dorian Finney-Smith, Alex Caruso, Denny Avdia, whoever, yeah. that's fine. But, like, if, yeah. you're real, if it really comes down to it, like, you want to try to acquire probably one or two more guys that are – capable ball handler creators to take that load off Joel. So he's fresher at the end of playoff games. Yeah. And also more importantly to me, you still can, if you acquire Paul George, you still mm -hmm. can acquire good role players. You have five yeah. first round picks and 17 million in space to go get one of those guys. And then yeah. potentially bring back Ubre, Batum, whoever, Lowry. With the remaining space, Lowry, whatever that yeah. makes it so that if you only use one of those first round picks, you could get to the deadline. And if, OG and Anobi isn't going to become available. Yeah. But like if Cam Johnson, OG and Anobi, Mikel Bridges, whoever becomes available, yeah. you have options again later. So mm -hmm. I do think that I, I support the Paul George plan, even if I'm a little bit skeptical because of the health and age, mm -hmm. but just because you're getting him for nothing. And history yeah. tells us that if you want to win when the league is this stacked and talented, mm -hmm. I think you need at least three capable guys that are – like near legit all-star level. And I think yeah. that that's like the sun's probably poisoned the big three thing for a lot of people, but also yeah. me and you both know that the reason why that doesn't work is Redundancy. because those players, the, they're all so similar. Yeah. And it's like, yes, those kind of big threes don't work in the same way that LeBron James, Anthony Davis and Russell Westbrook didn't work. Yeah. But we've also seen like the, no one's saying that about the Celtics or the wolves no. who all have at least three all-star caliber players, if not yeah. more. Yeah. And, and, and they just, they just complement each other better. Yeah. Like, it's, it's hard to pull off what the nuggets and the Mavericks have done. And, and the difference to me is that Luca and Jokic have taken their game to another level in the playoffs. And yeah. more importantly, they like Joel's amazing. Mm -hmm. Joel and Tatum and guys that are in the two way mold of star, History tells us that those kind of guys are not generally the best player on championship teams. The best right. player on championship teams are generally offensive creator types that can solve any defense. And yeah. that's not what those guys' games are. So you need to build your team a little bit differently than you would if it is, you know, a, a Jokic or a Luka. Yeah. Because those guys are like like the Wolves literally had to build a team just to beat Jokic. Yeah. And the Mavericks are now experiencing the the, the they're now reaping the benefits of that because yeah. Luca's the only other guy in the in left in the playoffs who yeah. can solve any defense and he's taking down yeah. the best defense we've seen in fifteen years. Yeah. And another reason I would be personally go towards the three star route if I was the Sixers is at the end of a playoff game, if a defense like doubles Maxi, fronts Embiid, prevents them from getting uh, the ball or, or whatever defense throws that way. Are you comfortable with Alex Caruso taking the last shot, or or do you prefer to have a Paul George or a you know Jimmy Butler like be able to create something? Yes, because that's that's 
what the playoffs often come down to is release valves. Because yeah. when you are facing another team for seven games in a row, you learn those tendencies. So you learn that, oh, the first option doesn't like this. The defense adjusts a little bit. So you want to have as many different looks as you could throw out a defense. And to me, Paul George or Jimmy Butler or Brandon Ingram provides more looks that you can throw at them than three good role players. Yeah, exactly. And like, honestly, the more I think about this, like the last player that was the not in this mold, like it's yeah. a, really the guys that are in this mold that we're talking about are like Steph, LeBron, yeah. Jokic, Luka. The yeah. only guys in between those teams that did not have those kind of uh, that were the best player on championship teams and Tatum might become the next guy yeah. that is in that it are Kawhi and Giannis. And the yeah. thing with Kawhi and Giannis is that what did those teams have? They had multiple different other shot creators, Drew yep. Holiday, Chris Middleton, very good, solid defensive foundation around those guys. Yep. And then Kawhi, like same thing, Siakam, Lowry, like yep. I do think that you have to look at those kind of teams if you're building around Joel Embiid yeah. and think, okay, how can we build a team that is good enough both on offense and defense? Because this was the first year in the playoffs where Joel, like it's like even the Hawks series, he mm -hmm. was in that series averaged like 30 on good efficiency, but yeah. had a ton of turnovers, was not quite the playmaker that he's become. Um, and yeah, the rest of the team sucked for most of that series, except for like Seth Curry, who turns into his brother for a few games. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like if you're trying to build a championship level team, I think you need to think more in the idea of how can we be a dominant two way team instead yeah. of being a dominant, uh, just offensive team. And Joel needs a little bit more help on offense than he does on defense. And Paul mm -hmm. George still one of the best two way wings in the NBA. Yeah. And, uh, uh, uh by the way. It's me and Sam talk about this on the podcast all the time. And one of the yeah. reasons why I'm a big, if you have a top 10 pick, don't take a role player or a guy that you think is going to be a role yeah. player. There's always exceptions. Like Franz Wagner yeah. was a, basically a, a good role player in college and he became a star in the NBA. Uh, Devin Booker, same thing. Uh, yeah. Donovan Mitchell. If you're Jer Jared McCain's probably a good example of someone that you could see like, Hey, if he has this elite skill, yeah. right. If he has this elite skill of shooting, and everything else in his game develops over time. Like he, gets, yeah. he becomes a better ball handler, better defender. There's a star pathway for him, right? Yeah. One of the reasons why I think that when you're drafting at the top of the draft, that you should always be swinging for those archetypes like like the Celtics did yeah. uh, with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown is because you can't acquire those players. Like you either have to overpay in a trade to, uh, to, to get those guys or you mm -hmm. have to draft them. And yeah. The guys that are currently available, like Paul George is the first one that's hit free agency in his mold, even with his age and all of his issues. Yeah. He's the first guy of his caliber two-way wing to hit free agency since 2019. So get yeah. that guy if you can get that guy and figure out the rest later. Yeah, because like players don't hit free agency anymore. Yeah. They just, they just don't. a rare circumstance. Yeah. Like the, the extensions and everything, people make so much money now that they're like, give me an extension. And then two years later, I'll ask out. You will uh, provide the the request that I do because players are in the league me. now. Yeah. So, you it's know, you don't want to piss off my agent. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and you, you get, get draft picks, picks in case Donovan yeah. Mitchell ass out. Yeah. Yeah. You you get draft picks. I get my money. Everyone's happy. Yeah. Um, and like, frankly, to me, Paul George fits better with Maxi and Embiid in my mind than Butler too. Because, like, Jimmy is is not really a three-point shooter too much. I, he's improved in that area, I, I'm pretty sure. But, like, I don't – I'm not as worried about him from beyond the arc as I am Paul George. And, like, a lot of his stuff is on ball. Paul George can fit more off ball. And, like, Maxi can do off ball stuff, obviously. But I think you want to explore his on ball creation uh, because he has skyrocketed from, like – a cool player, like a good young prospect to, oh shit, this guy might be like a one B on a title contender at, yeah. at some point, if not now, uh, like that's that seven points in what, like 17 seconds or whatever it was in eight points, right? Eight. Yeah. Something like that. No, you that might stretch, right. it was seven. Yeah. That stretch was absurd. I was, yeah. I was watching that, uh, with friends live on playback and we were all losing our goddamn minds. Like, what the hell is happening? We thought the game was wraps. We thought the series was over. We were yeah. like, our season is done. 
we've moved on and i was like it, 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 no and yeah it was seven seven points in like yeah 17 18 seconds whatever yeah it was. and the thing with maxi is that when we drafted him mm -hmm. i was like oh my god i'm so excited this guy might make an all-star team one day yeah like my, in my mind he was like maybe he can be bradley beal like maybe yeah. like, if he hits his top percentile outcome he might make two to three all-star teams yeah and you know worst case scenario he's probably a good bench guard that you could just plug in and throw any he provides in a better yeah. tj mcconnell or whatever this is before i knew tj mcconnell was a superstar <laughs> but um <laughs> I, I tj did, mcconnell's so, team yeah exactly um but <laughs> This was my mindset back in 2020 when we drafted him. I, I had him. It's funny enough, my two favorite guys in that draft at the end of the first. This is dumb luck. Like, I really yeah. am not like a genius scout or anything. I love Maxi and Bane. Those were my two yeah. guys. But it was because the Sixers hadn't had anyone who could dribble, pass, and shoot in like a fucking decade. Like, <laughs> it was this was before we got James Harden. This was when Ben Simmons was our point guard. And yeah. I was like, I need someone who can dribble, pass, and shoot. And these guys both have potential to be those guys. Yeah. And. The thing with Maxi is that when he came in, the expectation was like, man, maybe one day he could make an all-star team. Probably not, though. Yeah. And then he has that game against you guys in his in his oh, rookie geez. year where yeah. they just – all of our players were out because yeah. of COVID and they let him cook. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, he's definitely going to make an all-star yeah. team at some point. Yeah. And then the second year, obviously, the Ben Simmons thing happens. Mm -hmm. He just takes advantage of every situation he's put into, whether yeah. Joel, whether Ben's there or Ben's not there, Harden's there, Harden's not. Uh, he has turned himself into, I think, a top three second option in the NBA. I think yeah. Anthony Davis is probably the only guy that I would like sh for sure take over him because AD is so so much more of like a non traditional yeah. number two, where yeah. it's like he can anchor an elite defense and also be a good offensive player. Yeah. Um, whereas Maxi, obviously it's kind of the inverse where like mm -hmm. you think he can take, he, he's a ceiling raiser in terms of yeah. what he's able to do off the ball on the ball. And we're really just beginning to scratch the surface to see of what he can be because yeah. this was his first year where he was the guy a, as a perimeter option. And he had stretches even without Joel where it looked like, He's a surefire all NBA guy. And yeah. I, I I even think that and I've said this, I think that we're finally shaking. One of my biggest things is I talk about I talk about the draft all the time, but yeah. one of my biggest things is draft bias. So like mm -hmm. you would know probably better than anyone. When Jokic was a second round pick, yep. how long did it take for people to come around to the idea that he could be a superstar? Like three years, four years. At least three. I mean, I yeah. remember when he got his extension. Yeah, people were like, that's an overpay. What? He's getting a max. Yeah, they were like, that guy's getting a max contract. Yeah. <laughs> Not knowing that, like, analytically, he was the best young player since LeBron James. Yeah, and also, he was coming off a season where he averaged, like, 20, 10, and 7 or something yeah. like that. It was right. it was like, he had good production. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, no, I mean, analytically, he was already one of the 10 best players yeah. in the NBA. And... Uh, in just from watching him, you could tell yeah. like it is. It's also hard. Another thing, two two things with the dra there's the yeah. draft spot bias, and then there's also everyone always thinks this is something that I've noticed, and this is something I'm not the first person to point this out. Yeah, but upside to everyone always always means athleticism. Like yeah. Anthony Edwards has infinite upside because he's like one of the best athletes that we've ever seen. Yeah, Tyrese Halliburton doesn't, but like he's still like. He's a little bit older than Ant, but like, yeah, everything tells us that even those those guys like Jokic, Chris Paul, the the genius Luka. kind of passer playmakers, Luka, they get yeah. better into their late twenties and early thirties than anyone ever yeah. gives them credit for, and their games tend to age a little bit better because they don't have to rely on athleticism quite as much. So they have the longevity piece of it as well. But the reason that I, I talk about this is like Maxi's finally starting to pop now, where you see mm -hmm. the speed, you see the touch, you see everything. But yeah. he just shook the not big enough, not athletic enough, not, uh, you know, a, a, a lottery pick. Like, he shook all those expectations. Yeah. But it took until year four for him to do that. Yeah. Like, it, it, it is something that it, it was – it's kind of a cloud that hangs over players' heads where, like, I think there's a world where Tyrese Maxey is a top 12 player in a few years and, like – 
has a, a different career, but a similar career to a Donovan Mitchell or a Damian Lillard. Yeah. And that is something that I don't think that anyone could have expected even two years ago. And I think that yeah. we need to remove our expectations for what his ceiling can be mm-hmm. and just kind of let him grow into the role that he's kind of grown into perfectly. Yeah. And like, I think another reason I feel so good about the Sixers, uh, cause I do feel good about the Sixers moving forward. I think, I don't think that this offseason will make them a championship level team, but I think it gives them the tools to set up for like the year after to be a championship level team. Because I think it's really hard to like first year you get an entirely new roster together, basically outside of Embiid and Maxi and Ricky, uh, the third option, um, <laughs> <laughs> to to like have enough chemistry and enough, you know, know how to like win a championship. But I think the year after they could probably get there. Uh, but also, even if you don't, Tyrese is what, like 23? Tyrese is 23. He'll be 24 in November. Yeah, so next year he'll be 24. That's young as hell. Like, Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that yeah. I don't think people realize how young he is. I don't think that people realize how, how much better he's gotten even in the last two years. Like, two years ago, I don't know if he could run a pick and roll. And, like, <laughs> he's not the best pick and roll operator in the NBA, but, like, yeah. He averaged seven assists a game this year in the playoffs. He averaged like eight assists a game. Like, yeah. and I don't even think his playmaking is particularly good. I think that's just all a product of the defensive uh, attention he prov- he gets as a scorer that opens yeah. up his passing. It's kind of similar to Jamal, where like Jamal yeah. is not the greatest playmaker in the world, but he's working off of Jokic gravity. He's a good enough scorer and creator that he's going to demand his own attention, mm-hmm. and he makes the right plays. He's not a Trey Young. He's not a Luka Doncic but he can make the right plays. And that's all you really need when your scoring is as potent as those guys are when they're kind of feeling it. Yeah. And I just, Maxi is so fun to watch. Like I, as a Nuggets fan, I've I've been trained to dislike the Sixers, but I can't (laughs) like, he's impossible to dislike. It is very funny. Yeah. Like Maxi is just so fun. And and like Embiid is fun to watch uh, to me as well when he's not, you know, getting to the foul line, but that's also just because I don't like free throws. I, I go on my phone and scroll when I see free throws, regardless of who it is. Jalen Brunson was twerking on on people, and <laughs> I I love watching Brunson, but when he's you know getting to the line, I'm like, ah, I, I let me go on Twitter and see what people are saying. Hey, and look, it's... those playoff minutes are brutal. You got to condition yourself somehow. <laughs> that's yeah, the thing get... that they always say is like they literally <laughs> a lot of those guys become foul merchants because they're like. I'm tired from yeah. having to carry the load and I need to get to the line to give myself yeah. breaks more often. Like Luca is a hundred percent that way. Like, I mean, yeah. like you could tell over the course of a game that Luca really preserves his energy well because mm-hmm. of the fact that he can get to, and that's why he's always having a conversation with the refs. <laughs> like yeah. 90% of the time. <laughs> yeah. And like, I think that's a, a thing I'd like to see Jokic work on. Cause he doesn't get to the line as much as I'd like he's him just, to. He's the Steph of this. Yeah, like, like, the, 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 but the difference is that his play style is not quite as like finesse. Like he's a finesse player, but he yeah. also plays in the post. So yeah. like it's it, like you would you wouldn't expect Steph to get the line. Yeah, like he literally gets scratches. Yeah, <laughs> like on yeah. his arm, he's exactly. like, "I'm bleeding. Give me fouls." And the <laughs> yeah. refs are like, "And the refs are like, no, you're not. That, no, that's just that's from Party City." Have, yeah, I was gonna say he's he's cursed <laughs> to have that for the rest of his career. Yeah, for sure. That's that's why Peyton Watson's going to become a foul merchant in two years. Um, no, uh, if that happens, that is that would be funny. But um, yeah, like also, where did this Brandon Ingram stuff come from? Because I've seen that to the Sixers now a little bit, and I don't understand the Brandon Ingram thing because I don't think Brandon Ingram is good enough to be a third option for what you guys want to do. So. I think the Brandon Ingram thing is more of a fallback plan that has come around recently because I think they're going to target anyone who has contract negotiations that are up. So like, for example, I know for a fact that the Pelicans are not going to max him. We've heard this. We know this. And because of that, if you look at the history with these kind of trades, you mm-hmm. can tend to buy low on those guys yeah. in terms of what they're tra- – like, Jeremy Grant is a perfect example of that. The Pistons yeah. a few years ago traded him into the Blazers' cap space, and they gave up one first-round pick because they didn't want to pay him, and he yeah. 
wanted this big contract and the Blazers were willing to do it. And I think yeah. the Sixers look at it as a similar way where like, we're not going to overpay for Brandon Ingram, but if we can give one real first and one kind of Mickey protected first or yeah. the the first that we got for Harden, which is like the worst of three firsts, we'd be interested in a player like him. Uh, and then we could negotiate our own contract extension at, Mm -hmm. whatever number we think is appropriate we're not going to make that trade before we yeah. come to an agreement but um i think that's the idea behind it and i actually think that that is not the most unrealistic thing yeah. because i think in in my head the team that makes the most sense in a three three team trade for them is the atlanta hawks because the Hawks are now in a situation where because they got the number one pick, they're in the luxury tax. Yeah. And everyone's like, well, they'll just dump Capella and Hunter. And I'm like, that's a lot easier said than done. Yeah. Like, we saw yeah. this last year with John Collins where, like, they literally got nothing for John Collins. And yeah. they had – they created this massive trade exception, um, but they didn't do anything with it. And right now I do think that they're in a scenario where, like – for example, if – I know the Pelicans like DeJounte. Yeah who's basically just guard Brandon Ingram anyway. They're very similar yeah. players. They both live in the mid-range. They love to have the ball. Uh, they're decent three-point shooters. Uh, DeJounte's shot better recently and shot a lot more recently. Yeah. Uh, their defensive reputation, especially DeJounte's, is better than I think what the reality of their defense is. But I do think that there's a scenario where they get DeJounte, we get Brandon Ingram, and then the Hawks get the cap relief of us taking Brandon Ingram into space, them dumping DeJounte's contract, and we can send them, like, two first-round picks, and then if the Pelicans need to send whatever they need to send, yeah, ha have them work that out as well. But the reason I say this is there's a world where if you can come to a contract extension agreement with Brandon Ingram before you trade for him. Yeah. That you could have a scenario where if you get him to waive his trade kicker mm -hmm. because you're giving him – a hundred million dollars three year extension yeah. whatever um then i do think that there's a scenario where uh they can get up to 32 million dollars in cap space in addition oh, to brandon okay Ingram. so that's the idea behind it is like okay you miss out on paul george but here's a guy who has a smaller because he's only on that second max instead of the third yeah. or fourth max that you can get a guy who's only making 30 whatever million and preserve a lot of rest of your that's the value yeah. of the brandon ingram trade where you still have more space to use in other trades and in in free agency where you can acquire multiple other good role players that fit around those guys mm -hmm. and also I, I i just think we gotta rethink the way that we think about the majority of players because like I kind of think there's like 15 players in the NBA who truly, truly matter. Yeah. And then the rest are all just dependent on role and context. And like yeah. the majority of those guys that are dependent on role and context are guys like Brandon Ingram. Like a few years ago, there were players that have been great in these playoffs. Like Carl Anthony Towns was great and yeah. everyone was out on him two years ago. Uh, and Julius Randle didn't get a chance to redeem himself, but like he could, if he were able to play this year and had a nice playoff run, there's yeah. always a guy like I I've said it I, I had a tweet about it where it's like there's always one guy every playoffs Andrew Wiggins Aaron Gordon whoever yeah. it is and in our minds we we say well that guy has to be good on defense and he has to be scalable on offense yeah but I do think that the Sixers situation as I just described with Paul George is a little bit different because yeah Joel's more like Joel's real strength is that he can be the anchor of your offense and your defense. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, then the defensive concerns that you have with Brandon Ingram, if he can bring you those things on offense that you're really looking for in terms of shot creation, he can scale up a little bit of his three point attempt volume, which he has said in the past that he, he wants to do that, but he hasn't had the opportunities who knows yeah. if that's true or not. Um, and and if you think that he can be basically Paul a uh, Paul George on offense, but younger and cheaper, and then slight worse on defense, but not like Paul George isn't quite the level of defender he used to be. Can you get sixty percent of what current Paul George is on defense? Then mm -hmm. maybe you can survive that kind of thing when you get into the playoffs. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think that like Brandon Ingram at the end of the day is really talented. Um, and 
it's always smart to make a bet on talent and hope that you can get them into the right role and context yeah. because he's always been a number one option and maybe that's just who he'll just be the new DeMar DeRozan where he's yeah. a number one option, but you're probably never going to win a playoff series if he's like your for sure guy and you don't have another star to go with him that's healthy like Zion hasn't been. But yeah. I don't know. I think that there's a world where he can kind of change his game a little bit and pop in a different context in the same way that like we're seeing with Porzingis now. Like yeah. there's so many guys that you just they have to find the right role for themselves. Yeah. And there's I mean, look, he was the second pick of the draft. He's made an all star team. Like mm -hmm. he's a he's talented. I just don't yeah. know if 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 his game is ever gonna be scalable enough to to really work on a team uh, a winning team. Yeah, like to me, I, I think what you said about rolling context is right. Cause like Jamal Murray was the second best player on a championship team if he's not with Jokic he's not as good as he is you know he he doesn't Same become I mean Max, yeah the Sixers were like f seven games below 500 when Joel was out and Maxi played or like 10 games yeah. below 500 and like yeah but he's the like I said one of the three or four best second options in the NBA yeah yeah and like I do think your defense especially if you get like a player like Caruso maybe or something because like I've asked around about Caruso to like people who you know, have worked in the league or do work in the league. And they say about probably two firsts is what he will get, like equivalent of two firsts. That's a and steal. yeah, and you guys I think could he's absolutely like, do that. I And I think that he's, I think he's still underrated. Like, yeah. I, I think that like, if you're looking for a connective guy on offense, the, the problem with Caruso mm -hmm. is that so few teams can sacrifice ball handling, playmaking and shooting from yeah. the guard position and still be good. But the mm -hmm. Sixers and the Nuggets and and the Celtics and these teams that are built around yeah. wings and bigs, they 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 could do it a little bit easier. Like they, yeah. I don't know if the Cavs can necessarily get away with that in the same way uh, that the Sixers can. Like yeah. I think that defensively he's one of the five best defenders in the NBA, and then I you agree. add in the fact that he's an improved offensive player. Like yeah, there's a chance that he's the Sixers version of like Derek White if he was ever able yeah. to be acquired. Like. And to me, I think whoever acquires him is probably the favorite to win their conference. Because, like, imagine if the Nuggets were able to get him. Yeah. Like, Christian Brown and, and the 2031 pick, or, like, Peyton Watson in the 2031 pick. Something along those lines of that package. Alex Caruso on, on the Nuggets is a demon. Yeah. Uh, Alex Caruso on the Celtics is a demon. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. The Bucks. I mean, the Bucks. The Bucks have nothing, but yeah. he would, like, any team that is – any team that has a lot of creation and needs point of attack defense, Alex Crusoe would take you yeah. from good team to great team. Yeah. And like, to me, he's one of the two non bigs that could anchor a defense in the league. I think it's like him and Herb Jones. Like I think yeah, you could much. legitimately. Yeah. And like, you already have an anchor in Joel. You have two anchors. now. <laughs> that, that yeah, defense the is best deadly. Point of attack defense in the air, the best pick and roll defense of any team in the NBA. Yeah. And, like, that is a great tool to have when you're going against teams uh, that run pick and roll in the East, you know? Like, if you need a guard of Dame Giannis pick and roll, even though it's not as good as people thought it would be, still good. Like, yeah. you could have Joel and, and Alex be like, hey, here you go. Have fun, Dame. <laughs> the only the only player that, ha that he has not really been – like, he guards Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum, like – he yeah. can guard up. He can also is one of the few guys that can still guard guards, which is yeah. like, it's so incredibly hard. The only guys I've really ever seen get Alex Caruso um, are Donovan Mitchell and Tyrese Maxey. And that's just yeah. because they have an elite combination of speed and touch. Yeah. Those guys are like built to beat any point of attack defender, really. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's it like they ice anybody basically in the league on point on perimeter just because Dude, Donovan, I think Donovan is underrated. Like definitely he's hundred percent. Yeah, like he is absolutely a top ten player in the league. Yeah, he, I mean, if you're telling me that you couldn't build a team similar like, now look, it's a little mm -hmm. bit easier to build around like Jason Tatum. Yeah. Because of the fact that he's a two way wing. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are just like we said, those are the impossible thing to find and acquire. Yeah. Um but if you tell me that you built a similar level team to the Celtics around Donovan Mitchell they could absolutely win the East and maybe the championship. Like he's yeah. that good on any given night. It's just that he's had a few, a few low lows and everyone defines him based on that. Mm -hmm. But man, if he was able to stay healthy, I think that would have been a really competitive series. And I think the people yeah. really were sleeping on sleeping on him in general in these playoffs.
Yeah, like, dude, I I think that he's he's so good. It it makes me the one picture I see that kills me every time I see it is him in the Denver hat when we oh, traded him. You guys drafted him. We traded him for Trey Li- Trey Lydon and Tyler. Uh, no, Tyler Lydon and Trey Lyles. And Trey Lyles, yeah. Oh my God, 2017 draft, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we also it's drafted Rudy Gobert. We built the Jazz. The jazz, yeah. We built the Jazz. Well, luckily and then you also built them destroyed the too. Jazz too, technically. Yeah. I mean, I know you guys weren't the ones that beat them, but the last year, but the the bubble the bubble iteration was uh, kind of <laughs> at least taken down by you guys. I I will say though. That, yeah. I mean, if it was Donovan Mitchell and Jokic on the same team, they would have. You guys would have been. You're already probably going to win multiple championships, and that would have been like yeah. a shoe in for a dynasty. Even as good as Jamal is, yeah, you dude. Could have traded Jamal, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Like Donovan would do what Jamal does now, but like better. Yeah, and he's also a good regular season player. Yep. Uh, one of the things that frustrates me is like the Jamal or Jimmy Butler players, where they're like. As a fan of of the team, like I love Jamal in the playoffs, but also I'm like, can you do that in the regular season, please? Yeah, but can, a little bit, can, make our can, lives can, a little bit easier. Can you just like not blow a 21 point lead to the San Antonio Spurs, please? Right. Can you get us the one seed, please? You, I mean, <laughs> how would you have felt about a Nuggets Maverick series with the way that I feel good about right it. now? I feel good. About, like, I feel a lot better about it than a Timberwolves series because I think sure. just matchup wise, like, I think one thing we've learned this postseason is matchups matter so fucking much in the playoffs. Yeah. Like, the Timberwolves and Nuggets, I think, um, also, the, the, it kills me that the Nuggets were right there. They blew a 20 point lead that they had in the third quarter in a game seven. And I didn't think that would ever happen. I thought they yeah. were, like, going to just, you know, I don't think they would, I didn't think they would fall apart uh, like that. But, to me, like the Wolves were specifically built to counter what the Nuggets can do. They had the defenders to hound Jamal Murray, and they had the defenders to make Jokic's life just a little bit harder than it typically is. And if you have those two things, it can slow down the Nuggets, especially if Jamal Murray has a calf thing and can't bring the ball up the court half the time. So you have to rely on Aaron Gordon as your secondary ball handler. Because again, your second best uh, ball handler on the roster is Reggie fucking Jackson. Uh, and then I think the Mavs don't have the personnel to do that. Like Derek Jones Jr. is a great perimeter defender, but he's not bothering Jamal like Derek uh, or like Jane McDaniels to me. Uh, and also, Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford, as great as they are, are not going to give Jokic problems like Nas Reed, Carl Anthony Towns, and Rudy Gobert did. They just don't have the personnel to do that to me. But do you buy? Do you buy that? Because someone said this in the middle of the Nuggets series. I think it was after mm-hmm. Game Five. They were like, the thing is, is that I think that everyone is so focused on stopping the the Nuggets offense. They never think to how do we attack the Nuggets defense. Yeah. And I I don't think that I thought this was defensively a bad playoffs for Jokic compared to what he where he was at last year. It was. And I thought that if KCP is a little bit banged up. Yeah. Then you add in that factor of the reason why that system works so well is because you have Aaron Gordon and you have KCP. And yeah. then it becomes, okay, well, maybe Luca's struggling a little bit against Aaron Gordon at the point of attack. All right, well, they yeah. do have Kyrie Irving. Like, I mean, like, they have someone yeah. they can throw the ball to and, uh, you know, at least generate some some uh, secondary offense for them. And mm-hmm. I, I do think that – I think defensively Dallas wouldn't have had an answer. But I yeah. also don't think that they've won with their defense in this series against the Warriors. Right. Like, their offensive rating is like a 128. Yeah. And the thing is is that maybe they would have been able to just score enough – on yeah. the Nuggets, and I think, like we said, we talked about like both Jokic and Luka would have been an interesting head-to-head matchup. Yeah, because they're both the two guys that are the best at solving defenses in the playoffs. And the thing is, is if you watch these these Wolves games, I don't even think they're playing bad defense. I think it's literally yeah. just the Mavs are running perfect offense every time yeah. because of Luka. It's similar to what Yo- like Jokic did this to the Lakers, where it's like, yeah. the Lakers' defense isn't bad. It's it's just the fact that, like, <laughs> the other team has Jokic. And, like, yeah. it's. I remember a few years ago when the Celtics and the uh, Warriors played in the finals. I had a mm-hmm. co-worker at the time at my job who was a huge Celtics fan, and he came in and mm-hmm. he was breaking down after game four when – Steph had that like incredible game where he scored like 42 points and yeah. he didn't miss in the second half. And it was like, 
and he was all oh, this went wrong and that guy did this mm-hmm. wrong and this guy did this wrong and then i was like the other team had steph curry and you did this. Yeah, yeah like, like some, some that, that was game five yeah, of the yeah. series where i was like the other team had Jokic and the wolves didn't yeah and like it didn't turn out to be enough to win the series but in a in a matchup like that it literally probably would just come down to who is better Jokic or luka and yeah luka at least has shown that he can solve playoff defenses yeah. and play at such a high level in the playoffs that he would have a, a puncher's chance for sure. Yeah, for sure. I think the Mavs could have won a series against the Nuggets. Uh, I think it, it's a long series. Yeah. Um, Something felt off with the Nuggets all year. I kept saying it over and over. Yeah. I was like, I don't care what the numbers say. Like, I watch this team and it doesn't feel like last year. It, that yeah. team last year felt like a really good team when you like yeah like everything was clicking like and then especially when you get the path that you guys got in the playoffs mm-hmm. where everything kind of broke in your fortune uh yeah. that it was like this is uh, it was by the time round one was over it was pretty obvious you guys were yeah. at least going to make the finals if not win the championship yeah so that that's the thing is like i i just felt like there was something off with this team kind of all year i think i think it kind of came down to two things one of which is is the bench. We didn't have the sixth starter sort of guy off the bench. Our bench, statistically speaking, was better than last season. But Bruce Brown could close for any of the starters if sure. they were having a bad game. Like if KCP was struggling, Bruce Brown. If MPJ was struggling, Bruce Brown. If Aaron Gordon was struggling, Bruce Brown. Uh, we didn't have that this year. Like the closest thing we had to it was Christian Brown. And like he's good, but he's not – doing yeah. the ball handling stuff he's not doing the shooting as well as bruce did even though bruce isn't a great shooter like he's a better shooter than uh, christian is right um and like reggie jackson did decent but jamal missed a good amount of uh, games at the start of the season so reggie jackson by the end of the season had lost a lot of his legs and like was worn down because of the minute load because he's like 34 or something like that he shouldn't be playing you know like 30 games to start um well don't worry we're gonna get him you guys are gonna dump him into our cap space when we get paul george because they're best friends so and and you might as well take zeke Naji while you're at it um okay i might stop you <laughs> <laughs> nah dude i and also i think it was uh a lot of i think calvin booth had too much dip on his chip this off season yeah um i'm writing a piece well, about it uh did you hear my theory about this when i talked about it on the podcast where i was basically like my theory was essentially that the ownership he went to ownership and was like mm-hmm. when you guys got kcp he was probably like, yeah we have created the perfect starting five like yeah this is what we want and my thought on that is that the ownership said that's fine but you need to find ways to save money yeah we're gonna pay all these guys and this was even before the new cba yeah so that's why he started <clears throat> stacking up on the draft picks in 2022 2023 and started taking swings at the end of the first beginning of the second yeah i i could see that what I think it is, is that Calvin thinks he's a great scout. And he is to some extent. You know, he got Christian, he got Peyton. Um, but I think he's a pretty prideful person. And I think when you land two picks, you start... I think he was, like, more confident in that process than he should have been. Because he was, like, talking about, we don't want to sign veterans that might leave one year later. When... Yeah how he won That's the championship exactly yeah yeah is that he signed a veteran that left one year later he wanted a sustainable model that's yeah. essentially what i was trying to get at too where it was yeah. like we can have the best of both worlds where we can keep yeah. the starting five together but we also will always have someone in the pipeline that could potentially replace them if we lose them yeah and, and i and it's it's a hard it's a really hard needle to thread yeah. because the draft is even if you're good at scouting the draft especially when you're drafting at the end of the first beginning of the second is still largely a crapshoot yeah it's an educated crapshoot like yeah. you can do all the all the pre-draft stuff that you can do but gg jackson was not good at south carolina gg jackson was great in the nba yeah. uh peyton watson was not good at ucla he's been gr- he's been very good in the nba um those bet on me, talent guys miss way all, more often than yeah they and yeah. same with the older guys honestly you guys you guys kind of had two and i know brown's not that old but you guys yeah. kind of had two of the old like the older guy that hit and then also the mm-hmm. tools guy that hit yeah in one draft like that's absurd that doesn't happen very often when you're picking no. at like 21 and 30 or wherever you guys pick. yeah so like and, and and i do just want to point out that like 
I still like Julian Strother. I liked him as a mm-hmm. prospect. Um, yeah. I think that he could be a bench shooter. And, like, yeah. that's kind of all you need him to be is, like, a bench two that can, you know, survive some minutes in the regular season for you. And mm-hmm. and a lot of the times with that archetype of player, though, they're not good until they're, like, 24. Yeah. And he's 21, maybe 22 now. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and, and... like, that's the thing is, like, we just saw it with Isaiah Joe, just had his breakout season yeah. at 24. We see it with... Uh, Sam Hauser, Duncan Robinson, run down the list of guys that are yeah. shooter. It's they almost always have to put on more muscle. They almost always yep. have to get into like uh, he's just not big enough yet. And if yeah. he can fill out, then he has a shot. Pickett, I I'm a Penn State guy. The Pickett pick from the jump was like kind of baffling to don't, me. Don't get me started. Yeah, that was <laughs> like... the one that I was like, I'm not really sure. I see. just because like yeah. in order for that guy to hit, mm-hmm. you have to be certain that he is perfect at everything because he's yeah. just small and not that athletic yeah and he's 24 so like, yeah so like that that's the kind of move that is like you got you might be a little bit high on your own supply yeah but then again you're gonna take those swings and sometimes yeah. you'll hit and sometimes you'll miss like to me strother is the one pick from this yeah. past draft that i still have any faith in yeah. um because he is i like to make gonzaga uh, I liked his, I liked his floater. I liked, you know, the shooting. Uh, and he was like, on defense, he was a little questionable to me, but he was like, not the worst uh, that I saw. I didn't watch too much Strother. Um, his but like, defense is good. He's just kind of gets bullied a little bit. Yeah. But like he's, that's he's what small. shooter doesn't. Yeah. Let's say and, even Isaiah Joe, who I really liked as a prospect. And yeah. when he was on the Sixers, our whole thing was always like, it's you. It's going to be tough to keep him on the floor in the NBA finals because if you're playing against a team that just targets him over and over, it's just, it's going to be tough, even if he's yeah. really good at everything else. Yeah. And to me, he was looking decent and then he uh, sprained his ankle. I think it was, and he was out for a good amount of time. And then by the time he got back, he didn't get another shot in the rotation, but like on the season, he had a 48.5 true shooting percentage and he shot 29% from three. Ooh, that is, the, well, that's not gonna. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't expect it to hold. I, I was gonna say, if there's one thing I believe in with Julian Strother, it's the shot. The yeah. Things that I worry about with him are the strength to score inside the arc. Yeah. And the strength to uh, defend. And yeah. like like you said, like shot twenty nine point seven percent from three. He only played ten minutes a game, so we d- the yeah. volume's always there with Strother. Is the thing is that mm-hmm. you like to see a guy that isn't shy about shooting because uh, they yeah. know the nine threes per 36. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. 48% no. on twos is not bad for a rookie. That's his yeah. size. Like yeah. that's like not ter- like I expected it to be. He was going to shoot really well from three and be like 40% from two. And then yeah. you're like, Ugh, can he ever get to, but 48% that's fine. You had something to yeah. work with. And then I, the touch with him is so good. And He's like six 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 seven, so like yeah, he's not big, but he's long, Tall. and he can yeah. yeah, and he he's gonna he's gonna be a tough guy to shot to sh- uh, block shots. So mm-hmm. like I think he of all of those guys, to me he's the best. That's the the best case yeah. that you have of of having a rotation bet that can be like a seventh guy. I I agree because like also the quickness of his shot is another thing I love. Like he just yeah. jumps that he jumps into it and just lets that shit fly. Yeah. And his like, not is so good. Yeah. And not in like a, the possession ends here sort of thing that you get with MPJ. Like he's not afraid to, to shoot, but he doesn't like hijack the offense to me. Right. Um, and that's the thing I like. So I like Strother long-term probably, but Jalen Pickett and Hunter Tyson, yeah, those, those picks are... made no sense to me at the time. And even worse in, in hindsight, and also, he gave them guaranteed four-year contracts, like it's, standard contracts. That's weird, and also more importantly to me is like, how do you go from drafting two athletes in one yeah. draft and then go the complete? Because all of those guys were yeah. not athletes; they were all yeah. just good basketball players, like in college. Yeah. Like, like if you're betting on Strother and Pickett, I don't really know much about Hunter Tyson to be honest. I know he's yeah. like a stretch four, right? He's like, a stretch four, but he's also twenty. He was also twenty-four. He yeah. was like, a, I think, a fifth-year senior or a senior coming out of Clemson, and yeah, like that's 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 tough because it's like, how many stretch fours even play anymore? Like, I think yeah. George, George Niang is kind of the last of a dying breed, and he can't play in the playoffs. Yeah, and like, to me, it just didn't make sense at the time because I was when we picked Jalen Pickett, I was like, we picked Andre Miller Light, like, yeah, huh? 
that's exactly what I. That's the perfect. When he was at Penn yeah. State, we all were like, "Yeah, he plays the booty ball." He's, yeah, um, you know, he's he's a smart player and he's oh for sure very good at basketball. He he would be great yeah. in the Euro League, but I just don't think that he is NBA level athlete athleticism. Yeah. That like I said, everything else had to fall into place perfectly for him. Yeah, like he was um, solid in the G League too, but like there was legit debate in the organization uh, between Jalen Pickett and Colin Gillespie. That's where our organization was. And that is not great. <laughs> That's yeah. not great. Um, he's what, 25, 26? Something like that. He was old coming out of Villanova, and he's hey, been there for a couple of years. But the recent Villanova, he was on – he wasn't on the 2018 team. I think he was right after that. Yeah. Um, but he was on the last few good Jay Wright teams. And more importantly to me, I'm not going to let draft bias get in the way anymore. I know he was undrafted. Mm-hmm. I don't really care about that. There are more undrafted players that are good now yeah. than there ever has been. Nas, like, Fred Van Vliet. Nas, Fred Van Vliet. I mean, even just like yeah. just rotation players. Yeah. Hayward Highsmith, um, fucking Ricky Council for the Sixers yeah. is definitely going to be a guy. Like, I think that there are more and more uh, Austin Reeves. Like, there mm-hmm. are more and more undrafted guys because they I, – I think this might – pivot back the other way actually yeah with the new second uh round exception that they added in the new cba where you can yeah. basically use get a four-year deal for those second round guys without having any sort of exceptions yeah uh on your books i think that this is going to be uh, a, a pivot back in that direction because teams haven't really valued second round picks yeah they've kind of looked at them as more of like uh well, we can just get that guy with undrafted. Like, yeah. we could just we could just promise him a contract or a two way, and we'll get him in the door that way. But now yeah. I think teams are going to be more likely to like actually use their second instead of waiting yeah. to to get a guy undrafted. Yeah, and like the thing to me with giving them the the contract specifically that was the that was the most flawed part of the, of the process in my opinion. Because like, if you like you guys, you're going to draft your guys. I get it. I don't like them. Uh, as players, uh, as people, I don't know them, but like, you know, they're, if you like them, sure. You're a GM. I, you know, more than I do. Uh, but also giving them four year deals while also giving Zeke Naji, who didn't play a four year, $32 that million. Was a, that, that you do know more than him in that. Scenario. Yeah. Cause yeah. you watched him and you know, like, I remember having multiple Nuggets fans reach out to me and be like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Cause I wrote. In my first year of doing like sports journalism, because I, I did some stuff for SB Nation, um, I wrote I think three Zeke Naji articles. <laughs> so I had higher hopes than anybody for Zeke. I was like, he's going to be the stretch four that they need. He's going to be yada yada yada. Like if he was good, I would be the first one to be like, guys, look, I predicted this like th- two two years ago. I saw I saw the potential. But one, he changed his shot form um, after shooting forty something percent in his first two seasons. They, he changed his shot form for some reason. Completely new to the shot, so he's not a stretch anymore. He is, like, theoretically switchable, but he's one of those switchable bigs that isn't actually that switchable. And, like, he had a couple good possessions on Luka Doncic, and people were like, oh, he can he can switch. And it's, like, the same thing. Like, Devon Reed was the LeBron stopper a few yeah, years ago. I remember that. Uh, yeah. Like, it's like, what are, what are we doing here? And, like, four-year, $32 million, That's a lot of money. Like if you're that's trying to save money, that was a shocking. Yeah. Like, what is the upside of that? Like, yeah. And like, that was what was so weird was like, do you know something that we don't know about Zeke? Yeah. And like, also who was going to pay Zeke 8 million? Who are you bidding against? You bid against yourself. And I'm, I'm all for paying your own guys. Like, even if it's a little bit of an overpay, Yeah. like, I I think especially a team like the nuggets that don't, doesn't get free agents. Mm -hmm. And is in, in, even with Jokic there, you're probably not getting a ton of people demanding a trade to the Nuggets. Yeah, I think it's fine to overpay your guys a little bit and be like, we take care of our guys. But when yeah. you're in a situation like that where it's like you're literally just competing against yourself. Yeah, and and it's not like it's not like even like the Paul Reed contract where like Paul Reed had all these non guaranteed years. Yeah, where like if we needed to trade it or waive the guarantees, mm-hmm. then it was fine. That's a fully guaranteed contract, and it's like yeah. you're probably just stuck with it now unless a rebuilding team sees that as an opportunity to get like picks or whatever in, in a yeah. trade. Like I'd be shocked if he wasn't traded this summer, but I don't know what a fucking Zeke Naji trade looks like. You know, unless you're 
Like, I think we you throw him in a problem. salary. We tried to move Furkan Korkmaz's $5 million <laughs> deal yeah. for like three years, and yeah. no one wanted it. Like, it, yeah. it's not viewed as positive. Like like you said, if, if you traded MPJ, you could probably get off it in, like, a creative way of, like, yeah. moving it into wherever. But because you guys have so few, and, like, you want to keep your draft picks. Yeah, like, and you want to keep your young guys, too, yeah. probably. Yeah, like, so, like, that's just a hard, that's another hard needle to thread. Where, like, yeah. if I were looking for a, a situation, like, I wonder if there's a team that would be interested in MPJ that could send stuff to the Wizards and then you could just dump Najee to the Wizards and then you guys get like Kyle Kuzma or something. Maybe, yeah. Because like my my thought process has been throw him as the salary in a Alex Caruso trade, attach mm. like a young player and a pick to him. So and then like maybe that Kane works. Watson, uh, Najee, the 2031. And a, and a first for a Caruso? Yeah. But once something again, like this that. is the same thing that we were talking about where like I think ownership said – you can't do those kind of trades because then your tax yeah. bill just becomes unworkable. The like, thing is, though, Caruso would be cheaper, uh, I think, than – Yeah, this year. But then the um, extension a year from now, yeah. if you're also extending Gordon and Murray, yeah. is like you're you're locked into the second apron. and For like, a long time. And Exactly. So, like, I think that – I do think that the, the Nuggets can have a little bit of patience. I don't mm -hmm. think that they should be, like, making any sort of panic moves. You took a team that realistically they're they're gonna not win the championship, but mm -hmm. like I think the Wolves are a championship level team. I, I agree. think that there were three championship level teams that were healthy and good and still together by the end of the year. And yeah. it was the Nuggets, the Timberwolves, and the Celtics. The yep. Mavericks run, you can tell me all that they have the best player left and they can definitely win because of yep. that. But that's not a traditional championship level team. Like yeah. championship level teams usually don't acquire guys halfway through the year and they mm -hmm. normally don't have a veterans minimum guy starting for them yeah like that, and a rookie that's like incredibly <laughs> important like that's the what's happened if this is what's happening with the mavericks right now is like what bill simmons would call like a black swan event like yeah it doesn't happen th often enough like the team that changes everything halfway through the season Mm -hmm. makes a run of the, the most recent example of this is the Celtics when they traded for Derek white and they, and they found their stride in 2022 and they lost yeah. in the finals. But even that team had already been to the conference finals multiple yeah. times had, you know, uh, a, a duo that had been together for years. Uh, uh, you know, even a core that had been together for years with Horford smart, all those guys, the Jays, Robert Williams, whatever. This is the second year of this Mavs team. Really, the first year when you consider the fact that Gafford or uh, Lively Gafford, uh, PJ Washington, and Derek Jones are all playing their first year, and Kyrie's playing his first full year, yeah, like this is some out of the ordinary. Like, I actually think even I this is going to be my new thing is that if they win the mm -hmm. championship, they still need to be aggressive in making moves and not make the same mistake they made in 2011, yeah, where they were just like sat on their hands and they were complacent, <clears throat> yeah, and let Tyson Chandler walk and whatever. Like, I think the Nuggets have a little bit more breathing room because, like, Jamal was hurt, KCP was hurt. Yeah. You still all, all – in another universe, you still would have been good enough to win the title because you have Jokic. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think you should be making panic moves, but mm -hmm. I think you should be making moves that, like I said earlier, like, if you can get 80% of Michael Porter Jr. for half the salary and keep KCP mm -hmm. and then hope one of those other young guys pops and yeah. you maybe have a, uh, get a pathway to access your MLE – yeah, and that is that that those are the kind of moves I'd be focused on for them, and yeah. not thinking about like let's push in all of our chips to go get X player or whatever. Yeah, I agree because like I th I've seen a lot of people trying to press the panic button and be like, should we trade Jamal Murray? And I'm like, should we trade Jamal Murray? What are you talking? What are you talking about? Have you watched no. the last like two posts? Like Gordon I get it. Jokic he... and Murray should be the core. Like that's, yeah, that's absolutely. At the end of the day, those are your three guys, and you ride yeah. or die with them. And like I. I think if we, even with Jamal being hurt, we were still one not blown 20 point lead away from making the conference finals and who knows what happens from there. Yeah. So like, to you me, it probably beat the Mavs and then you have a puncher's chance against the Celtics. And if yeah. Porzingis doesn't play, you probably win. Yeah. Cause like you also have two weeks uh, basically to give Jamal Murray some rest yeah. uh, in between the conference finals and the finals. And to get KCP healed up. We're seeing it so, with Luca right now. Luca yeah. looks healthier than he's looked in two months. Yeah, and it's like, I, I'm i still very bullish on the Nuggets. Um, but I do think they need to take a different process this offseason than they did last season because 
they they had the two rookies. They had Julian Strother. They had Zeke Naji. Those are four basically not great ro- uses of roster spots this season. They had Vlako Chanchar, who tore his ACL and, and didn't play at all. So that leaves you with 10 roster spots, one of which was given to DeAndre Jordan, which I don't have a problem with DeAndre Jordan being on the roster sure. because, like, he's a good, great locker room guy. You know, he genuinely does bring value to the team. But also, he – also, he was better as a backup center than Zeke Naji was this season. The corpse, uh, like the 35-year-old corpse of DeAndre That's Jordan wild. was better than Zeke Naji. I'm being so dead ass. Like he, he looked washed he, when he was on the Sixers two years ago. Like, yeah. I, I don't even know how that is possible. Yeah, and like he genuinely played decent in the in the Lakers series in a couple of the in yeah, like one that. game or two. Yeah, yeah, it's like he could still give you okay minutes, but it's like you're paying Zeke Naji eight million dollars to be worse than 35-year-old DeAndre Jordan or whatever it is. And then from there, from there, you had Peyton Watson, Christian Brown, Justin Holiday, Reggie Jackson, uh, and then the starting five. Justin Holiday and Reggie Jackson you don't want to be relying on. I know both of them had like okay playoffs. Uh, Justin Holiday had a good playoff run. Reggie Jackson was like hit or miss. Um, and then Peyton Watson wasn't playable by round two, and Christian Brown was like the only really solid bench piece. So that's six players that were like reliable. That is like nine wasted roster spots, arguably. Uh, not wasted, but you know what I mean. Like not properly yeah. utilized. Of course. So, yeah. so I think they really need to be purposeful with how they use those roster spots. I think you need to move off of Pickett and Tyson because yeah, that's pretty pretty obvious that you got to move yeah. one of those guys at least. Yeah, because they are on four year contracts. They have three years left. You can't have those two taking up roster spots. And also, what are you doing taking twenty four year olds if they're not going to play? Yeah, if you take a twenty-four-year-old and you'll know immediately, they're gonna sink yeah. or swim. Like that's yeah. the thing. It's like, and if you don't think they're good enough as twenty-four-year-olds, then there's very few guys that ever become NBA players that are like you have Jalen Johnson who was nineteen yeah. as rookie year that didn't play. Okay, I think he's got a shot. Like yeah, like that's the, one like, thing. Him and even he he is a little bit of an outlier in terms yeah. of the guy I think could make all star teams. Yeah, that's great. That didn't play as a rookie. Like that's pretty rare, even in the modern NBA. Like yeah, the Taylor Hendricks and Jarris Walkers, like they still have a shot because they're so young. But like yeah, history tells you if you don't play your rookie year, your ceiling is generally pretty limited moving forward. Yeah, unless there's an injury or something like that. But, yeah, yeah. But if you're if your coach is choosing not to play you on yeah. your team. And you're five years older than that. Like mm-hmm. you're you're dead for. Like I mean, if, if yeah. they can't play their second year, they'll be out of the NBA by the end of their rookie contract. Yeah, because also like you need to give Malone more veteran minimum guys, just people he can somewhat trust. Because the starters played the most minutes of any lineup uh, combined uh, by like a good chunk, and Jamal Murray missed like twenty five games. Yeah. So like that's that's tough. And I think Reggie Jackson was plus the stars was like 11th or something like that. So that is not something you want to see because that's probably why Jamal and all them were like ground down by the playoffs because they played such heavy minute loads. I have a question Uh, for you. Yeah. What if the Detroit Pistons called? Mm -hmm. They said, we will give you. Isaiah Stewart, mm-hmm. Marcus Sasser, yeah, and the fifth pick in the draft for Michael Porter Jr. Absolutely, yes. So, I don't know if that's realistic, but like, I maybe with their new GM, they're gonna have a mm-hmm. slower approach because, yeah. like, if this was Troy Weaver with his job on the line, <laughs> he would absolutely do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily even think they should do a move like mm-hmm. that. I mean, I like Sasser. I think Sasser's. Yeah. And I, I think Stewart uh, would fit great with the Nuggets. Like, I don't yeah. know if he's a good NBA player, but as I think we that's said a before, great backup. Cheat code. Cheat code. Yeah. Like, you can play the four with Jokic because you're switchable. You can yep. shoot so you can stay on the floor. You're a good rebounder. And then, yep. hey, you have a backup five all, all of a sudden. Like, uh, yeah. that would be a really nice option to have. And then I think it Sasser's would. a little bit. Sasser's one of the rare older guys that gets drafted and then might get a little bit underrated because he's already 23. Uh, but. Yeah he was a good college player and he was a good rookie player. And if you need ball handlers yep. and then the fifth pick in the draft, like that, that might be too much in terms of like what, because of the contract for Michael Porter jr. Pure value. But yeah. I like the fit of MPJ on the Pistons a lot. Like they need shooting, yeah. they need rebounding, they need size. And yeah. 
he if you want to keep Duran, I think that MPJ isn't the worst for to pair him with in the world um because you're going to need shooting around Cade and Duran yeah. if that's your plan moving forward. But uh and especially a Sar Thompson. Yeah. Um but uh that that was an interesting one to me. Maybe if it was just if if we removed cuz the thing is is that they're so guard heavy right now. Like yeah. I don't think people really realize like they have Cade, Ivy, Sasser, um, and also Quentin Grimes. Yeah. But then on top of that, they also have the fifth pick in the draft, and they need shooting. And the only guys that are surefire shooters at the top of this draft like are Richier, who's probably going to be gone. Dalton yeah. Connect, who, yeah, he's a wing, but he's older and he's a low ceiling guy. Yeah. Like, I think he's going to be a fine NBA player, but I don't think that you're taking him with the fifth pick. And yeah. then the other guy is Reed Shepard, who's also a guard. So, like, yeah. If they want to keep that pick, they got to clear the log jam a little bit yeah. of their guard. So if they're not moving on from Ivy, which I think they probably should, I guess. I, I think they will. Yeah. I, I I've they heard they too. don't love him. I mean, honestly, he hasn't played particularly well in his first two years. Yeah. But who the fuck would in that on that? Yeah. Team? Like, I, I'm kind of like, if you're a team that is, like, stuck in the middle of fucking purgatory. Yeah. Like, the Chicago Bulls should be on the phone every day trying to get Jaden Ivy. Like, Absolutely. A team that needs an upside swing, even if Jaden Ivey is just Dennis Smith Jr. or Emmanuel Moutier or one of these athletic guards that just never yeah. works out, the upside of trading what for him? Like, you're not giving up real value. Like, yeah. you'd probably get him at a pretty low price right now, maybe a rotation player. And, yeah. like, you're not doing anything anyway. So, like, yeah. I, I kind of think that there should be a team out there that is like, all right, let's put him in a different context. Let's simplify his role a little bit more. Let's hope that, like, playing with a, in theory, stretch five like Vucevic, quote unquote, um, could help uh, Could help in that circumstance for his uh, for his game. And uh, we can kind of go from there. Jay and Ivy, you are a Denver nugget. Uh, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I don't think you guys are really in the ch in in the context to no, 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 we're not be I, taking I'm... risk like that. But like, yeah. those are the kind of moves that if they work out, like holy shit, look out, kind of thing. Yeah. Like, I I just don't believe in I. I liked Ivy a lot as a prospect. I had him third I, on I, my board. I, I had him in the same tier as Chet. <laughs> I had Paulo one. I had Chet I two. I had Ivy three, and I had Jabari four. I. And, I just I, never bought that. I I never bought that Jabari could ever be a star, which I think is yeah. kind of proven out to be in the NBA. And I, yeah. I I can't put you top three if I think you have no chance. Yeah. And those guys, I thought they all had a chance to be stars. Yeah. So like that was the thing is that like I don't know what team it is. Maybe the Washington Wizards. Like maybe like a team that is just like we don't have anything going on anyway. Yeah. Let's take a chance on Jaden Ivey. But uh. The talent's there. Like if you're if you like Isaiah Collier in this draft, Jaden Ivey was a way better college player than Isaiah yeah. Collier, and they're similar guys. Like yeah. you might as well take a swing on Ivy too. Yeah, like I I had Palo one, Chet two, Jabar uh not Jabari, uh Ivy three, Duran four, Jabari five. Mm -hmm. Um and for similar reasons, you know, I I just didn't buy the handle with Jabari or shot creation in general. Uh and to me, Risa Shea is, is that way too, where he's more of a theoretical shooter to me than an actual shooter yeah. right now, because like he sure he shot good on the entire year, but that was largely in like one stretch. Yeah. And then the rest of the season, he shot like 20% from three. Uh, the thing I like about Rishi Shear though, is that I do yeah. think that he takes a, he has a, a large diversity of shots. That's like, fair. There are some shooters that shoot, 40 percent and then you watch them and you're like oh they're literally just standing in a corner taking yeah. the easiest most open threes that is not the case for him like yeah he does take tough shots and yeah he doesn't like he's almost kind of like an mpj type where like yeah he'll run off screens and shoot he's he he has a little but it is a funny thing because i also don't buy the creation with him but yeah it's funny that you say that because like i'm like it's it's always such a funny concept to me when a guy is a tough shot maker who mm -hmm. also cannot create. <laughs> because yeah. it's like if you're a tough shot maker and you want that to pan out, you kind of have to be able to create yeah. because like you're not going to get a lot of opportunities in the NBA where you're even able to show off that skill set. Yeah, cuz like if MPJ was not in Denver, the the tough shot shot diet that he gets would be pretty hard to get without like a Jokic yeah. or like a Luka or a, a Tyrese. He would be great in Indiana. Um yeah. but he would be. Yeah, but one trade I had uh talked about with uh rusty buckets was he was like i he texted me and he was like 
can I get your thoughts on this trade? And he was like, the Nuggets should trade everything uh, off the bench. Okay. Um, and we talked about it. And it was basically, he had an idea of like Peyton Watson, uh, Julian Strother, a pick and like other, some just some other stuff, right? Uh, but that was like the core of the deal for Caruso, um, Drummond and Javante Green. And I was like, I, I kind of like that because like, well, well, Drummond's a free agent. Yeah, no, it was like sign and trade. Sign and trade yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I like I was the like, idea of that for sure. Yeah, I was but like, the reality oh. is like Chicago's impossible to deal with. Yeah, it's and never going to happen. But I turn, I know for a fact that they turned down Gary Payton the second, Trace Jackson Davis, Moses Moody, and a first for Caruso at the deadline. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. a lot. of like, That is a lot. I mean, I guess if you're out on Moody, it's not. I still think Moody can be an NBA rotation yeah. player. So, like, yeah. I'm not, like, of that mindset. I don't think he's going to be the guy I thought he was coming out of college. Like, I thought yeah. he was going to be, like, a really good fourth or fifth starter. I think he's mm-hmm. more like a bench guy. But, like, he's still a rotation player. And yeah. then you add in the fact that, like, Trace Jackson Davis was good as a rookie. I know he's older. Mm-hmm. But, like, Gary Payton, you could probably rehab him and flip him for value at a certain point. Yeah. And Caruso is very good, but, like, if they're turning down those deals, what do they really want? Because, like, yeah. it's impossible to predict what the, – they're kind of like the Raptors in that, like, I just don't know what their direction is and I don't know what they want. Yeah. One week the Raptors are trading OG Ananobi for two prospects and the next week they're trading Pascal Siakam for three first-round picks. So, like, yeah. w- 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 what's your direction? <laughs> Yeah, and like they also traded for Kelly Olynyk and gave him an extension, and they and also Oshai traded Abaji, for. But yeah, like, Abaji was like a throw-in, but like they say he was the reason they gave up the first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then like last year they traded for Jakob Pertl and gave yeah, like a mo- like a pick, and it Which ended is up now being the eighth, eighth pick in the draft. Yeah, they gave. I don't care that it's a weak draft. The eighth pick for Jakob Pertl is a bad trade. Um, the eighth pick- the eighth pick in 2013 would have gotten you Contavious Caldwell Pope. Yeah. And like that's, that's, I think that's he was the eighth or ninth pick in the in the 2013 draft, which was yeah. the last time we had a draft like this. Yeah. Or like 2015, like Porzingis went in that range. Like yeah. he went like fifth or something. Like, yeah. It's, the, just the, like... it's, it's asinine to, to treat first round picks like, especially when you're a team like Toronto who only be, builds through the draft. Yeah. Like you're not going to get another Kawhi Leonard probably. So what are you? No. So no, you'll never get like, that. That was a fucking once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. And the yeah. only reason that that even worked out was because you nailed OG Ananobi, Pascal Siakam, fucking uh, Fred Van Fleet, all of yeah. these later picks and, and undrafted guys. Like you need to get back to trying that and taking as many swings yeah. as you can and not trading a top 10 pick in the draft. The last time you had a top 10 pick, you got Scotty Barnes. He's good. He's really good. And, no, and by the way, no one expected Scotty Barnes to be as good as he is. Yeah. And that is the kind of thing that you should be doing right now. Yeah. Like you should be taking swing. Like in this draft, if they had the eighth pick in the draft, they would probably take Ron Holland mm-hmm. or they would probably take like Cody Williams or yeah. one of these guys. And then there's a there's always a chance that these guys t- turn out to be something much better than we think they are and then yeah. that like i said it changes the outcome for your franchise yeah dude i'm i'm not ready for the miami heat to draft zach edy and turn him into a stretch five. Oh my god <laughs> oh god edy edy i guess i didn't really think jaime hotkes was their kind of prospect last yeah. year and he turned out to be a i mean i i liked him a lot yeah i had him top 20 but i didn't expect him to be as good as he was right away for a team like yeah. Miami. Like if, if they take it, there's a handful of teams that if they take Edie, I'm going to feel kind of vindicated on how I feel about Edie, but there's also mm-hmm. a handful of teams where if they take Edie, I'm like, Oh no, yeah. I was completely wrong. Yeah. Like, this is going to be like, if the bulls take him, it's going to be a disaster. Yeah. If the heat, or OKC or one of these Grizzlies. teams that like yeah the Grizzlies if they take him I'll be like all right so they see a little bit of something that I see yeah um but the re- the reality is that it's probably going to be the opposite yeah you and I have talked about Edie a couple of times I'm pretty sure um I am not high on Edie you are high on Edie yeah uh, we will well, see high who's relative to the well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I have him twelfth on my board like, yeah I I don't have him top five. I know people that have him like top seven like you what. I know someone who has him number one on his board. Huh? And and I actually think he's, in my opinion, the best drafting person on the internet. Oh. Matt Powers, at DraftPow, 
Um, huh. If you haven't checked out his stuff before, he does great work. For I, I know Matt. Yeah, I, Matt. yeah. Matt yeah. has him number one, and he went on Chuck's podcast and did this whole <laughs> argument, which is what turned me into, like, I see it. Mm-hmm. His whole argument was, if you look at the guys that are kind of shift the paradigm of the NBA, yeah. they're all outliers in some way in terms of mm-hmm. size, athleticism, skill. Jokic is probably our most recent example of a player who you could have never seen this coming yeah. when he was a prospect, right? And yeah. he's not even saying he's going to be Jokic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he more compared it to Alperin Shangun, Demonis Sabonis, those okay. kind of offensively tilted fives that you have to build a little bit. You have to give them a little bit more space to operate. You kind of have to build the team in mm-hmm. a different way around them if you want them to kind of reach their full potential. But defensively flawed fives that can yeah. lift up an offense in the space in the spacing era and be kind of an offensive hub. And his whole argument is Zach Eadie will literally be the largest player in the NBA when he comes into the NBA. Yeah. Like He will instantly be... Tall, he's taller than Victor Webinyama and he's bigger than Jokic. Yeah. Like he is in in and in beat. Like he weighs more than those yeah. guys and he's and he has enough of offensive skill between his touch that he showed a little bit in uh from the free throw line and and uh, a little bit with uh some extended elbow jumpers this year. Yeah. And the touch inside and the passing and the defense has gotten has gotten better every single year in college that if mm-hmm. you're going to take a shot on a guy who is an outlier in this draft, why not draft the best college player from the last three years and hope that those things continue to progress and build your team in a different way than meets the eye? Because in a draft like this, where you're so unsure about even the best prospects who I like yeah. in this draft – in a draft like this, it's I think it's a worthy swing to take that swing on a guy like Edie. Um and yeah, the bottom could fall out, but the bottom fall could fall out on any of these guys. Like I, yeah. I think that none of them are perfect prospects. And uh I, I mean, we always have one guy that we're like, this guy isn't gonna fail. Mm-hmm. The closest I can get to that in this draft is Sar. Yeah. And even with Sar, it's more like how I felt about Evan Mobley in twenty twenty one, where I'm like yeah, he's my favorite prospect in the draft, but like if things don't really pan out for him, I could see him just being a good role player. Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel about Sar. We're like Yeah. I could see him being I think people have compared him to like Nick Claxton. Like I could yeah. see him being that guy or I could see him being the Evan Mobley, Jaron Jackson Jr. level yeah. guy too. So like in a draft that is just filled with question marks, if you have the tenth pick and the ED's there, fuck it, why not? I, I get that argument. Like, I do understand that. But to me, though, if you're trying to take a paradigm shift, right, it would kind of need to be, to me, someone who I feel like could be the best player on a, on a good team. And even at Edie's, like, 100th percentile, you know, outcome, I don't see him being that. Like, I don't see any of these guys being that, though. Yeah, no, I don't either. Um, that's, the, that's the whole argument. Yeah, it's like, that's fair. Uh, even the guys that I like, like if yeah. Jalen, if 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 Ron Holland pans out, yeah, he's basically Jalen Brown, right? Like that's like mm-hmm. the idea behind him. Yeah. If Sar pans out, he's Evan Mobley. Yeah. If whoever. These are all second best players on teams. Yeah. So the guy that is the best player, we haven't identified that guy yet. Yeah, yeah. And that's the hard part is, like, and especially because once you get past those guys, it's like guards and like how many yeah. teams even have a guard as their best player like it's very not few. Many. Like yeah. the, the best teams usually have a, a wing or a big as their best player yeah luca is like probably the only one of the real contenders that's a guard and he's six yeah. seven yeah and like the the thing about it to me is like if zach Eady is your second best player to me that's a flawed like team that you can kind of exploit a little bit you know because of of the defensive foot speed i know it's improved but i still think he'll struggle with that at an nba level um and if you're drafting him with the idea of oh maybe this is the second or third best guy on our team um, maybe the best or maybe the best uh i i just think that even at his like best outcome there's exploits to his game that will still hinder him like Sabonis is a great player but I don't think Sabonis will ever be a second or third or best player on a championship level team because of hard to imagine yeah yeah because of the inherent flaws of 
defensively, he's not fantastic. You know, he's his shot is not great. Like I, and even if he comes out to be a, a Shen Goon, a a Sabonis level player, I that archetype of player I'm pretty low on as on the whole. But he, here's my here's my thing back to that. Mm-hmm. In most drafts, I think that this argument couldn't be made in terms of most of the teams at the top are bad. Yeah. Yeah. The, that's not really the case this year. Like yeah. the Hawks were in the playoffs last year. Mm-hmm. The Rockets are probably going to be in the playoffs next year. The Spurs have Wemby. Like yeah. really the only teams I think that could really afford to take this kind of risk are the Wizards who have nothing, mm-hmm. the Hornets who have nothing except for Brandon Miller and Lamella Ball who never plays and ran over an 11-year-old's foot. Yeah, also that's possible. Yeah. Um and Speed kills. And the Pistons, who have kind of uh, nothing, the the the, the problem, What I'm getting at here is that yeah, most teams don't want to sell, and most yeah. teams think too highly of themselves to take Zach Eady. Yeah. Whereas my argument back to that would be, you're a poverty franchise. You shouldn't <laughs> you shouldn't think that you're better than anyone. Like like let's be like most of the teams down here, except for really the Rockets and the Spurs are like kind of stuck in the middle of oh the grizzlies too like once yeah. again, it's kind of a weird year and also the, the league is so talented now yeah that like it's i just think there should be more teams that are willing to like if the bulls take Edie, they should blow up their roster and try to see if they can build up around him i'm not even joking <laughs> because if okay. it fails then yeah. they can get cooper flag next year or they Fair. can be in the they could throw their hat in the ring for the next first Cam loser so yeah, like yeah. you're you're taking a risk in this draft, but you're also giving yourselves a pathway to like like maybe it fails and in two years you suck again. Great, we'll get mm-hmm. another shot at it. Like yeah. I don't know. I think it's a worthy risk for a team that's stuck. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a worthy risk for like the Spurs who are like yeah. have a generational player and like it doesn't make any sense for them. Yeah. But for teams that are stuck and they can worry like if the Chicago Bulls are worried if Zach Eady can stay on the floor in the playoffs mm-hmm. You got to get to the fucking playoffs. Yeah. Fair. Like most of these teams are not even going to be in the playoffs in the next two to three years. Yeah. And if you want to take a risk, there's at least some upside to that. But I think he ends up falling into the teens. And then I think realistically his ceiling is probably like Jonas Valanciunas or something. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that he's, yeah, Zubac, Jonas. Val- I mean, look, if you could get a 7 5 Zubac and you're in the Western Conference, does That's it good. hurt to throw him out there for 10 minutes a game on Jokic? Like, yeah. I mean, like maybe he just gets fucking diced by the two man game and <laughs> yeah. it's un- unplayable, but I mean, it is, he's at a minimum, a nice change of pace guy. Yeah. I, I can definitely understand arguments for Edie. It just kind of goes against my draft philosophy of like, I just don't in my head. It just doesn't register as like a thing I would want to do you if I ran a franchise. Brain. Yeah, I do. Um, cause I, brain, which I get because you root for a team that won the championship. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you, if my approach to this is I kind of look at it the other way where I say mm-hmm. like, I don't worry about that stuff until I get to that level. That's because fair. If Edie's good enough to get me to that level, I can attach draft picks to him and get a better player. Yeah. Yeah. Like, my, that's, that's the thing is like three years from now. <laughs> oh no. I, I traded him for Donovan Mitchell and then we're, we're <laughs> And we're and we're we're in a better situation. I don't have to worry about him deep in the playoffs. Yeah, my um, my uh, <laughs> my thought process with building teams is I'm always trying to build to being a contender, right. um, and therefore I build with the process of I am a contender. How do I get there? Uh, yeah. And I try and make moves that a contender would make. Um, well, there's never been a contender in the history of the NBA that didn't have a one A. So if you don't have a one yeah. A, yeah. So then, then I'm not. No, I'm not even just saying for Edie. I'm saying if you're drafting yeah. at the top of this draft and you're drafting a third option, yeah, you're probably fucked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. The, the, actually, <laughs> the difference in this draft is that everyone in the top five, except for the Wizards, uh, have at least the idea of a, of one of yeah. option. Trey Young, Wemby. Uh, Cade, all those guys. Mm-hmm. I don't think necessarily that that's a worthy, yeah, like thing yeah. to do. But that is the idea behind it. Yeah, yeah. My my thought process would be, okay, Bub Carrington, Jared McCain, uh, Devin Carter. You know, one of these guys who's like lower on a lot of people's boards, but probably high on mine. If I, I haven't made one yet, but like if I were to, I've made mine. I have all three of those guys in the lottery. 
Yeah, I, I, I've kind of started making one. I would have all three of those guys in the lottery if I were to make one. Okay, so um, I, have, I actually have McCain at 16. So okay. a little bit lower. But I would have McCain I, top I 10, probably. I hear the um, case for McCain. I just think I just think he's too small. But I, I hear fair. the case for him becoming like we what we discussed earlier. Yeah. And to me, one of those three guys can fit into a mold of being a, a two option, a three option on a contender. Because even if they're allowed to run buck wild for the first couple of years of their career, you can then transition them into, you know, uh, like McCain, for example. If you draft him and you let him just be your point guard for two years, and then you draft a, a Cooper Flag or a Cam Boozer or someone, a VJ Edgecombe, just someone along those lines of like someone with the potential to be a 1A. Um, he has developed, hopefully, the idea would be that he develops the ball handling necessary to be like a great release valve, like we were talking earlier. Because like he, McCain will primarily be used off ball in my head at the NBA yeah. level. Um, but if he can do secondary, tertiary creation stuff, that's a aspect of his game that he doesn't really have right now, but you let him run point guard for two years. He develops some ball handling, even though he su like might suck as a, a primary, you then transition him into being a secondary. And I actually think his creation's a little bit underrated too. Like if you buy yeah. the shooting, I think that what his role at Duke is, is probably going to be what his best role yeah. in the NBA is. But I think that his ball handling and creation is fine for a guy yeah. in his role. Like I, I, I don't think that he's I don't think he has star. Like Dillingham has a star level handle. Like yeah. is he too small? Probably. Yeah. But like maybe he can be the outlier guy that is the small guard that, that tends to not pan out, that pans out because <laughs> he has that elite skill. Yeah, I think I probably have Dillingham three on my board. Um I'll tell you right now where I have him. I have him four. Yeah, that's I that's have, around. I have Saar, Holland, Topic, Dillingham, Reed, Klingon, Cody Williams, Bug Carrington, Devin Carter, Stephen Castle, Deron Holmes, Jalen Tyson, Zach Eady, Dalton Connect, Zach. Uh, Zach I haven't really watched uh, enough of uh, Zachary Richier, but I yeah. have him lower. Uh, and then I have uh, Buzelis, Collier, McCain, and then uh, Jacoby Walter. Yeah. Uh, off the top of my head, I'd probably have Reese Shea outside the top 17 probably maybe outside the top 20 just because i don't buy his i i don't buy him i just don't buy he might him. be the first pick in the draft that's how weird i know this draft is. i know like it's it's insane to me because i don't i just don't buy him as a prospect like that's how i yes, feel about buzelis yeah i i haven't watched a ton of buzelis but i don't i also don't love buzelis uh from what i saw like you know uh of these like are, the these are idea teams. players these are not yeah and i struggle with those guys a lot of yeah time. i do too and like it's one thing if you're drafting a peyton watson who's an idea guy at 30 if yeah. you're trying to draft him at one or two that is insane to me because he's a shooter that shot like 20 percent from three for like four months and also before this year hadn't shot above i think 35 percent from three in any uh level and he doesn't have any shot creation ability, really, that he's shown on tape. Defensively, he's decent but and moves well. But also, I view that more as a like complementary piece to a, a game rather than like... He's not a lockdown defender to me. He's not yeah. a Bilal Koulibaly. Um, and if you're not a defender, if you're not a shooter, if you're not a passer, a shot creator, what are you? Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough sell to be honest. I, yeah. I think you're you're basically just buying on the shooting and the tools and then you just yeah. have to figure out the rest later. But the the thing the other thing about him is that like the mid-range stuff is okay. Uh mm -hmm. the free throw stuff is meh for a guy yeah. you project as a shooter. Yeah. Um I I mean I couldn't be more out on a guy that is going to be probably the second or third pick in the draft. <laughs> yeah. Like I think Sar ultimately ends up going one and then I think I think that the Wizards have a, a real choice to make here, and I'll be mm -hmm. I'll be interested to see because they are not afraid to take a raw young prospect like they did with Bilal last year. Yeah. But the difference here is that they were picking at nine, and yep. Bilal kind of was a guy that rose very late in, in that draft process, and Rishier is a guy that's been kind of locked into this top of this draft, and like 
they're also such a blank slate team that like even with Bilal, like I'm not projecting Bilal to be a superstar. Like yeah. he's grown, he's shown improvements and he's been good for a rookie. Yeah. But I still think there's a world where he's just like a solid role player. Yeah. Um, and if that's the case, then I think you need to be swinging for someone that you think could be a potential star. Like I, I wouldn't be shocked if it ends up going Sar Topic or Sar Dillingham at the end of at the, at the top of this because because they yeah. just feel like safer star bets to me. I don't think that yeah. they they might not even reach the ceiling, but like it, yeah. the idea of what they are, there's so much more evidence of what they are long term as opposed to him where we're just. Yeah just guessing basically yeah like to me topic i i really like topic he'd probably be four for me i it's a toss-up between him and dillingham for me um what i don't understand why people are low on topic i don't either like the shot isn't great but there are some indicators that like it'll has come there along. ever been a free throw shooter that shoots 88 percent from the line and doesn't yeah that shooter? doesn't yeah Literally like the worst i could think of is like dennis schroeder yeah and if dennis schroeder even is 80s, like yeah. yeah. Dennis Schroeder's a fine shooter. Like, yeah. he's not, like, a nothing shooter. Yeah. And then, like, the driving, the passing, that's special. Um, he, He's special at those areas. And, like, also... Dominated a, a player... as at 18 years old in, in a European league is, like, the yeah. biggest green flag for me. Yeah. Uh, and, like, to me, another player that gets underrated is Dursic. I really like Dursic. Um, I haven't seen, like... Well, that's why people <laughs> fade Topic, though. Yeah. Because Dursic was so good in the same role, just a different kind of player. Yeah. And, like, I, I've watched the, the games where they both played together. I watched them where they both played apart. I don't think Dursic is as good as Topic, but I'd probably have maybe a lottery grade on Dursic in this draft. Um, I know I he's older. Second round right now. Yeah. Like, I think he's probably the player I'm most different on consensus. Unless you're considering Risa Shea, but I feel like a lot of people don't love Risa Shea. Yeah. Um, but like, I think Durisic might be a lottery level prospect. Um, we'll see if that works out. If it does, I will come back in three years and be like, look at the 205 mark of this podcast I recorded three years ago. That was supposed <laughs> to be about the 76ers. Uh, <laughs> but, everything but. Yeah, but I mean, we, we did briefly talk about the Nuggets and Sixers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but. Um, yeah, man, I like Dursic to me is, is good. Like his passing is good. His his shooting's good. Yeah. Like, I don't think he's as good of a passer as Topic, but he makes like more than basic level reads. I think he's pretty all right defensively. And like his shot is is pretty solid. Um, based on the little that I've seen, I can see the, the appeal and the upside of Dursic just because he does, he does pop on tape. I mean, yeah. that was the thing about Topic that I really like, though, is that, like, yeah. I'm like, this guy lives at the rim. Like, that's mm-hmm. where I think that I think that people are kind of underestimating production with Topic, where it's yeah. like, there aren't 18-year-olds that produce in Europe at his level unless they almost, like, even all the busts that yep. come over from Europe, all of them either pop later, like, in their, like, 20 year old season or whatever 22 year old season Mm -hmm. or they're they just were idea players yeah like people will always point to like the bus like hizonia and you know all these guys that are just beneficiaries of other foreign guys kind of popping off jogging bender was like in it was the year after porzingis went yeah all of those guys were kind of still rough, rough, rough raw prospects when they came over here. Topic yeah. isn't really that at all. Like Topic is like pretty well rounded for yeah. a guy his age. Yeah, like at any level, uh, yeah. and I, I think it's the same for Durasic. Like I, he's older than Topic and has less star upside in my opinion. But also in a draft lacking in star upside, I think he's not like the worst bet to make there. Uh, like he might be. My Zach, e- your, my version of your Zach Eady in this sure. draft, where I'm like, I don't think he'll be a star, but if you're gonna aim for a star, why not take a swing on the like 21 year old European that is I would a say good that's sh- that's actually Bub Carrington for me more so okay. than Zach Eady. I okay. Bub like seven or eight on my board. Um, I I also have him pretty high if I were to make mine. He has star indicators. Like he if does. you watch him play. He gets his own shot anytime he wants. Mm-hmm. He's an elite pull-up shooter. 
the finishing uh and getting to the rim in general could be better for me mm -hmm. yeah but if he puts on some weight and can get better in that department i like the playmaking i like the tools for being a passable defender three level yeah he could be a three level guy and like i don't, I think the pull-up shooting is the most underrated thing when we look at guard prospects yeah if you're a good pull-up shooter or you at least have the touch indicators like the floater game uh the yeah. diversity of shot the uh free throw percentages and volume there's almost no way that you're not a bench level guard and like if you're a bench level guard with his tools then you have a pathway to becoming a star yeah and like he's been mocked to the nuggets a couple of times dude i i'd be so stoked if he fell that far i feel like there's no uh, way he could fall to 28 i feel like he's i feel be late teens early 20s uh, and, yeah and maybe even a chance to rise up further yeah, I, I don't I don't think he'll fall to twenty eight. I think more realistically, you're looking at a Deron Holmes or a Jalen Tyson, both of which I like as well. But like Holmes is if the he, perfect fit for you guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But like, if if, if Bob Carrington falls to twenty eight and the Nuggets take him, I'm pretty bullish on like him developing into something good. Oh because, yeah, yeah. Like playing with Jokic, learning from Jamal Murray, like. You know, he, I love that context for him. Yeah. He would definitely um, be on the, in the perfect situation for himself. And even yeah. he might be one of those guys where it's like Fred Van Fleet, where he's like a complimentary guy when you have better players and then yeah. those players go on to do, they leave in free agency or yeah. they just age out of it or whatever. And then he becomes a all-star in 25, 26 years old. And by the way, that's seven yeah. years from now. <laughs> he's 19. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's young. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. He's, he's the youngest American player in this draft. So Yeah. And uh, one last thing before we round it out, because we are running at two yeah, hours and ten minutes. Um, and I want to give you the chance to, like, eat dinner or whatever. Uh, but <laughs> um, what would your ideal pick for the Sixers be? If, assuming you keep pick 16, like, what are you looking for? in a prospect i don't do anything but best player available okay i don't think that you can draft for need ever i'm like okay. pretty i'm like pretty and unless a situation like the nuggets i understand yeah. drafting for need yeah a situation like the sixers where we're blowing up our roster yeah <laughs> like we have three players under contract yeah. next year uh i think you just take the best player available um mm -hmm. The guys that I project to fall in that range that would be best player yeah. available for me would be, I think Devin Carter's going to be too, he's going to go way before us now. Yeah. I think Dalton Kinnick will go before us, uh, even if I like the fit of both of those guys. Yeah. Uh, potential guys that could fall to the Sixers. If the league lets Cody Williams fall to 16, mm -hmm. I would be Spam fucking draft. thrilled to get yeah. That's like... That's the scenario where, like, we might get best player available, best prospect available, and also need. he's a great fit and need for what the Sixers yeah. need right now, yeah. which is just a guy that can – and once again, I'm always looking for – the thing that I'm looking for with these guys, like, even if they drafted Jared McCain, I'm not crazy high on Jared McCain, yeah. but I know Jared McCain's going to be able to play in his rookie contract because he's yeah. an elite shooter. Like, yeah. Worst case scenario with Jared McCain, he's Landry Shamit. And like yeah. Landry Shamit gave the Sixers positive value and the Clippers positive value on his rookie contract. Yeah. And I'm fine with that kind of pick. I yeah. the guys that I would hope that fall to them would be those are like my my long shot guys are like Cody Williams falls for some reason. Yeah. Um Ron Holland falls for some reason. Even mm -hmm. Dalton Connect falls for some reason. Uh but the realistic ones in our range that I like. I'd be fine with Tristan De Silva. I'd be fine with Jared McCain. I'd be fine with mm -hmm. Isaiah Collier. And then if we want to go a little bit further on guys that I'm just personally higher than, I would reach for Dayron Holmes, Jalen Tyson, or Bub Carrington right there. Yeah, because are you talking BPA like now or BPA like projection future sort of? More more best prospect than player, I guess. Okay. Like, like I like Bub Carrington more than – uh like some guys that might be better right now. Like KJ Simpson's yeah. a better player than Bub Carrington right now. Yeah. But long term, I think Bub has star upside and yeah. high role player upside. And I think KJ uh, Simpson is like a backup point guard. Yeah. Um so that's the difference to me. It's like I would rather just take the best pro Daryl tends to stay away from the project guys just in general. Mm -hmm. 
I yeah. think he'd be more likely to take a Devin Carter or a Deron Holmes yeah. that are proven good basketball players that are high production guys that can plug and play right away. That makes sense. Uh, but I, I do, I'll, I'll say this much. I like mm-hmm. all these guys. I do have a slight fear with Deron Holmes if he doesn't get drafted to the right context. Yeah. Because the thing with him is like, if he got drafted to the Sixers, if he's not a good shooter right away, it's hard for me to say he's a jack of all trades kind of guy where like he doesn't yeah. really have an elite skill. And in the Nuggets where everything's just easy, like he'd be fine. But yeah. in a situation with the Sixers where like he has to be able to shoot, I would be a little bit worried about a guy like that. But in general, yeah, I'm going best prospect available long term more so than than right now. And I think the two that are like my ideal best of both worlds in that yeah. uh, are Cody Williams and Bob Carrington. Like, I think they both can play on the rookie contract. And I think that long term they're they both have like starter level, if not star level potential. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, this brings a uh, very short recording to a, to a somewhat natural stopping point. Yeah, my parents are probably um, going to think I died in here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, good discussions are, are good conversations. Um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, but uh, you want I, if you guys like basketball talk podcasts, uh, you know ball podcasts on Patreon, oh, yeah. on, on playback, on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I will throw that in, in the Twitter and the description. Anything else of yours you want to plug or that's it. That's that, right. those are all the good ones. Just hit that up. If you like the show, subscribe to the Patreon. We're almost at 700 right now. Um, and if we get to 750 by the draft, I will be doing uh, a special thing for the draft night. So let's see, oh. let's see if we can get there. I haven't announced I... it yet because I'm skeptical on whether I'm actually going to do it or not, but <laughs> I don't. I don't know whether that's a threat or that's a that's a good thing. It's a no. Well, I'm it's joking. a positive. I'm, it's a positive thing for people who are watching. It might be negative for me. Let's. Just I know. I, I was joking. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, uh, thank you guys for watching. If you've made it this far, uh, you're a sicko, uh, and I love yes. you. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys at some point. Thanks for having me, Asher. Yeah, thanks for having it. Bye.